Well, good morning and welcome to the, um, the meeting of the Justice yeah, yeah. Committee. Agenda item one is a decision on taking item seven in private, which is uh, consideration of our forward work programme. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Thank you for that. Agenda item two is consideration of an affirmative instrument on Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Act 2015, Support for Victims Regulations 2018 draft, and I welcome Michael Matheson, Cabinet Secretary for Justice, and his officials, Peter Hope Jones, Human Trafficking Team Leader, and Louise Miller, Director of Legal Services with the Scottish Government. I refer members to paper one, which is note by the clerk, and um, Cabinet Secretary, do you want to make an opening statement? Uh, good morning and uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Act 2015 Support for Victims Regulations 2018, alongside the separate commencement order for Section 9 of the Act, place support to trafficking victims on a statutory basis. It set the relevant period for support at 90 days and specify that victims of slavery, servitude and forced or compulsory labour uh, also have a statutory right to the same period and type of support. Scotland is the first part of the UK to make this support a statutory right, and the 90-day period represents a doubling of the current period of support and a longer period than el anywhere else in the UK at present. I announce the intention to set this period at 90 days on the 13th of June 2017, following consultation, and it's been welcomed by the Independent Anti-Slavery Commissioner, uh, kit charities that work directly with victims, and by all parties in Parliament. The offence of slavery, servitude, and forced or compulsory labour is set out in Section 4 of the Act. Consultation showed strong agreement that the proposal that victims of this crime should have the same level of support as victims of human trafficking. Section 10 of the Act empowers Scottish Ministers to make provision for support for Section 4 offence victims, and these regulations specify that support should be in line with that for trafficking victims. These regulations will bolster the support to victims of these terrible crimes, and alongside the other reforms in the Act and the Trafficking and Exploitation Strategy, we help to move towards a Scotland free of the suffering caused by trafficking, slavery and exploitation. Okay. Thank you for that. Do members have any comments or questions for the Cabinet Secretary? John Finney. A brief comment to welcome this provision. Uh, convener, you'll recall that we examined this in the last session and all the evidence suggested that there needed to be additional support put in place, so it's very welcome. Okay. Any other comments? No, nope. that being the case, agenda item three is formal consideration of the motion in relation to the affirmative instrument. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has considered and reported on the instrument and it has no comment on it. The motion will be moved with an opportunity for formal debate if necessary and the motion is motion 10054 that the Justice Committee recommends that the Human Trafficking and Exploitation Scotland Act 2015 Support for Victims Regulations 2018 draft be approved. Cabinet Secretary to move. Move. Thank you. Do members have any comments? In which case I put the question, which is that motion 10054 in the name of Michael Matheson be approved. Are we all agreed? We are all agreed. That concludes um, our consideration of the, form, uh, of the affirmative instrument. The committee's report will note and confirm the outcome of the debate. Are members content to delegate authority to me as convener to clear the final draft uh, report? Content. Content. Thank you for that. It only remains for me to thank the Cabinet Secretary and his officials for attending and suspend briefly to allow a change of witnesses.
Agenda item four is the roundtable evidence session on alternative dispute resolution. The purpose of the roundtable is to explore issues around the use and availability of alternative uh, dispute resolution in Scotland, ADR for short, and any barriers to its use. Um, I welcome all the witnesses and um, look forward to hearing the evidence at this roundtable uh, session. By way of uh, an introduction and starting, then I'll introduce myself and then if we go around the table just uh, seeing who you all are and who you represent, then we can take it from there. I'm Margaret Mitchell, I'm the convener of the Justice Committee. I'm Gail Scott, I'm one of the clerks to the committee. And Diane Barr, I'm one of the clerks to the committee. Phil Tindrig at MSP for Coatbridge and Chrysan. Well, hello, is Murdoch, Mediation Coordinator, Edinburgh Sheriff Court Mediation Service. Good morning, Ben McPherson, MSP for Edinburgh Northern and Leith. I'm Andrew McKenzie, uh, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Arbitration Centre. Hey, Martin Vaughan, good morning. John Finney, MSP, Highlands and Islands. Uh, good morning. I'm Robin Burley, and I'm the Chair of, the, of Scottish Mediation. I'm Liam MacArthur, MSP for Orkney. And for the purposes of uh, this morning's discussion, I should also declare that my wife is a mediator with Relationship Scotland Orkney. Thank you. I'm Angela Graham, QC. I'm a practising QC. I'm the Vice Dean of the Faculty of Advocates. But the written submissions have been prepared by one of our special interest groups in the Faculty, uh, Faculty of Advocates Arbitration. They have a special interest in arbitration and other forms of dispute resolution. The Faculty obviously also has a strong interest in litigation as a method of resolving disputes. Uh, but I'm here today to address the issues on the agenda. Okay. Good morning, I'm Colin Lancaster. I'm Chief Executive of the Scottish Legal Aid Board. Morris Corey, M MSP for West Scotland. Uh, Craig Connell, QC. I'm a practicing solicitor advocate. Uh, I'm not here representing any particular area of, of ADR, but happy to address all of the issues. Mary Gujon, I'm the MSP for Angus North and Mearns. George Adam Paisley's MSP. Daniel Johnson, uh, MSP for Edinburgh Southern, and, and I'd just like to uh, draw members' attention to the fact that my wife is a practising solicitor at the firm uh, Pinsent Masons, uh, which uh, Craig Connell is uh, also, uh, who also works for this. Just wanted to make that clear. Rona Mackay, MSP for Strathkelvin and Bears Den, and Deputy Convener of the Committee. We've chosen the, the round table format, which is a bit more flexible, a bit more informal, though the evidence is very much still on, on the, the record, but it does a, a, allow a free exchange and for, for people who are here as witnesses um, to, to be able to engage with each other. But if you could just indicate when you want to speak, and then we do that through the, the chair. Uh, and you don't have to worry about your microphone. It will automatically come on when you're called to speak. Um, can I also say that it, it was very helpful to have written submissions, as, as it always is. In fact, we've been inundated with submissions over the last 24, 48 hours. So this morning, we'll be concentrating on you know, just feeling our way uh, with arbitration more generally um, and, and then maybe following up with another evidence session, taking in some of the other um, submissions that, that look at particular aspects. Uh, I said arbitration, I mean alternate dispute resolution. So can I start by asking the panel the different types of alternate dispute resolution and um, the various advantages and disadvantages in your opinion? Who'd like to start? Yes. If, if, if I could just uh, say something just before I answer the direct question, if, if I may, I'm happy to deal with the different uh, topics and what I might do to assist the discussion is mention a number of the types of ADR and that may prompt some of the other uh, helpful, d d d yes. discussion. I just wanted to say this, that um, uh, while we're here to discuss ADR, and I understand why we're here to discuss ADR, uh, I would speaking personally and without any axe to grind at all, uh, be disappointed if we uh, headed down a route similar to that south of the border, uh, where there is a pretty firm drive to keep people out of the courts, uh, whereas uh, in this jurisdiction, at least so far, the courts have been perceived as a, a part of the provision of a public service uh, to which everybody should have access in an efficient and cost-effective 
uh, way. So the notion that one should really try to keep everybody out uh, seems to me to be potentially quite... Uh, that is an, uh, uh, an angle that I think we will go on to as the, the discussion develops, but thank you for pointing in, that In out terms of, of different types of uh, ADR, uh, I, I'm conscious there are a number of people here who are speaking particularly for different uh, areas. The, the ones that occurred to me uh, when I was asked to appear here uh, were as follows. Arbitration, uh, and we have uh, Andrew McKenzie in particular, who's a great promoter of, of arbitration. Uh, in other words, the, the selection by the parties of a decision maker uh, under a statutory scheme. Uh, mediation, uh, and again, we have a number of speakers on particularly focusing on, on mediation. So in, in effect, uh, a chaired negotiation. Uh, that's just my term, it's not an official definition. Um, uh, there are, are others that I, I perhaps just mention in passing um, because there aren't people here particularly dealing with, there's a thing called adjudication. Uh, now some of the committee members will be very familiar with this, uh, but in the construction industry, uh, the, the statute imposed a form of dispute resolution out with the courts uh, some years ago, um, sort of supposed to be quickened, uh, cheaper than going through the courts or arbitration. It's not perhaps arguably an alternative in the normal sense because if you have a construction contract, you must use uh, adjudication at least first. You can then challenge it later. But I wanted to mention it so that the committee was aware of it. And the other one that occurred to me, again, it's not particularly one on the agenda uh, of the speakers today, is a thing called expert determination. And that, that is used in some contractual structures, essentially where the parties agree that if a particular type of issue crops up, they will send it away to an expert, whether it's a surveyor or some other type <coughs> of expert, whose decision will then be uh, final. Um, it's, it's not quite like arbitration because it's not treated as a sort of quasi-judicial determination, but it is another mechanism that some people use to reach a, a decision. And ha having given that, that outline, I'm happy to contribute to the discussion later, but perhaps I ought to, to stop now and let others speak. Thank you. John Starrick and then Robin. Yes, I, I can pick up on a, a general issue, Chairman, uh, and that's to do with the term ADR, or Alternative Dispute Resolution. I think I've mentioned this in the paper which uh, I, I was submitted on my behalf rather hastily last week. I think there's a danger here, and we may already have had a hint of it, of the um, various different options for res resolution of disputes being viewed in some way as in competition with each other. And I think one of the causes of that may be the description of alternative dispute resolution. So in many jurisdictions, ADR is no longer used as a description of what are, as Craig has fairly said, a large number of possibilities for helping people to resolve disputes. The question really is alternative to what? And in the earlier days, I think what one was looking at was, was alternatives to court, to, to litigation. But really what we're looking at here is a range of different options by which people who have disputes which are unresolved and which they've not been able to resolve themselves can be assisted in the early and effective and efficient resolution of the disputes. So I would counsel the committee, if it feels able to do so, to move away from using the expression ADR and alternative dispute resolution and to look at a range of dispute resolution options. Now, there are a number of these, obviously, and Craig has outlined these, and for me the question to be asked is, what are the appropriate or what is the appropriate process um, or offer to those who have disputes which are unresolved, which helps them to resolve these quickly, effectively, constructively, and efficiently. And there will be a number of questions which arise from that, which allow us to look at the different forms of dispute resolution, maybe to work out, if you like, a hierarchy. I mean, the reality is that the vast majority of disputes are resolved by people themselves. Uh, they're resolved using what we would call negotiation, whether that's skilled or, or, or not. Um, those which are not resolved by people themselves are then resolved with the assistance of others using negotiation. It's only a very small number of disputes which require the assistance of a third party. So, for example, a question to ask would be, when is it appropriate to use a, or to involve a mediator as that third party? When is it appropriate to involve an arbitrator? And when is it appropriate to involve the court? The court in most jurisdictions and 
certainly historically Scotland has been slightly out of step here, is viewed as a last resort for all sorts of reasons. And it seems to me that these are the questions and issues that the committee might wrestle with. So that's helpful, you know, to think of it as a range of dispute resolutions. Yeah. And uh, you had a small question on the back of what John's just said mm. before I bring in Robin. Just off the back of what, what, what John Stark and, and Craig Connolly just said, I mean, I'm just wondering whether or not, uh, based on what you're both saying, is that we should be viewing things like the small claims court as, as one of the, the threads to this, i.e. kind of not just looking at alternatives to court, but also what, what options there are within the court system and indeed whether or not there are sort of simplified uh, routes through the court system that, that might be available to people or should be made available to people. Uh, is that a, 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 a fair thing to say? That's fair to say. I would take it back a step, Daniel, if I may, and ask still, what is the most effective way for people to resolve their small claims? Is that through an adjudicative process where yeah. a third party pronounces a decision, or might there be a number of these cases in which using a negotiation process would effect an even more helpful result for those involved. So there are principles to be applied, and then you're right. If adjudication by a third party, including a court, is appropriate, what is the most effective and streamlined way of doing that in the circumstances? Robin. Thank you. <coughs> um, my, my point was going to be very similar to John's, um, that the term ADR tends to cover a very mixed bag of apples and pears. Um, but I think one thing that might be quite useful to think about is that uh, we have on one end of a spectrum interest-based uh, systems of coming to an agreement and at the other end of the spectrum a, a rights-based uh, spectrum. And uh, that arbitration is very much in the rights-based and mediation is very much in the interest-based. And uh, that spectrum that was described uh, earlier um, covers, in a way, a range where interest can come into it and rights can come into it as well. So um, I think that might be a, a helpful way of looking at it. Um, as I said, in, mediation is very much in the interest-based area, and what follows from that is that it's voluntary and it's facilitative. Uh, mm -hmm. And those two, I think, are, are key aspects of it. But I think another thing that might be useful to consider is that mediation is not only an alternative to the courts or to tribunals or to ombuds. Uh, it has a phenomenal reach um, and it's operating from the playground uh, through family situations which are not necessarily ones that come to court, through communities, workplaces, commercial and public services and of course then in the shadow of the uh, the courts, uh, tribunals and ombuds. Uh, so it, that reach, I think, uh, defines something slightly different about mediation, which also, uh, I think, is reflected in that mediation is also about a way of having dialogue. Um, and it is very important, I think, that that underpins the way that people deal with difference and the, the way they deal with the disputes that may come from difference, but not necessarily come from difference. And so it is about, mediation is also about the change in the culture of how we deal with things. Okay. I'll leave it at that. Very wide-ranging, and, and people yeah. of all ages, from the very young to the very old, can, can perhaps uh, benefit. We've got Angela and then Andrew. Thank you very much. <clears throat> if dispute resolution, as opposed to... ADR could be seen as the umbrella term and underneath that umbrella there are various methods of resolving disputes and that includes litigation, arbitration, mediation and the others that are were mentioned by Craig Connell. These are all options for individual clients and the decision on which is the best method to be used to resolve the dispute should be carefully considered with each individual client with advice from their legal advisor if, if they have one. Looking at the differences between each, there are advantages and disadvantages to each method and all of them have both advantages and, and disadvantages. They're not all appropriate for each individual and they should be carefully considered and the best method tailored to their needs can then be selected. Unfortunately, 
litigation, in a sense, is not represented here today because the agenda is ADR and the barriers to using ADR, and that's obviously very significant. But to give, if we consider dispute resolution as the umbrella term, it is important not to exclude litigation. And as Craig Connell says, we wouldn't like to ignore that completely because that is a fundamental important part of the package of methods available to clients. Thank you, and that's helpful. And then Andrew? Uh, yes, I, I, mean, I, I would agree with, with, with what Angela has said, uh, that it's about the range of options that Craig and John discussed and therefore it's about making sure that uh, the public uh, that parties understand what the options are so i think there has to be more around information uh, for people including small businesses uh, about the options um, and then it comes to uh, an actual dispute uh, it's about practitioners about advisors making sure that those parties are aware of the options open to them and that could be mediation arbitration or litigation and uh, as Angela says, uh, there's no right or wrong uh, in respect of those different options. It will depend on the case in question as to what's right for, for the parties involved. Okay, thank you for that. Colin? Really just to pick up on, on some of those points, I think one of the things that struck us is that there's a permeability between a number of the forms of dispute resolution. And it's not necessarily that uh, a particular dispute will go down one route or another, and, and quite often thinking about the things that, that, that John's been describing, you'll start off the negotiation, um, per perhaps in anticipation of court proceedings uh, or to avoid court proceedings. Court proceedings may result from a negotiation which hasn't successfully settled the matter, but it may have narrowed down the issues in dispute for that litigation. Uh, and indeed, through litigation, referral can be made to mediation uh, in a variety of circumstances. Again, the mediation may bring an end to those proceedings or it may further narrow down the issues resulting in a subsequent settlement or uh, indeed a, a narrower uh, litigation to come from it. So it's very often not one or the other, um, but you might expect people to, to try a range of different ways uh, of resolving the disputes, particularly if they're, they're, they're uh, quite tricky ones. Well, that's a good opening to give us a, a basic understanding, Rona. Thank you, convener. Yes, um, just on the back of what we've been saying, um, I'm just wondering, you know, um, how often is the client advised of all these options? And I know how I'm trying to get a scale of how often people use um, ADR. Is it something that's recommended? And yeah, and is it something that's recommended regularly um, amongst the profession? Well, certainly, uh, I, I speak. I'm the Vice Dean of the Faculty of Advocates, so we generally are involved in litigation. Mm. Although we have a strong interest group in uh, arbitration and mediation, and we are training large numbers of advocates in relation to these areas mm. so that they can be very effective and give very detailed advice to clients. Having said that, in many situations where an advocate is involved, it will be because litigation has started. Mm. And so in a sense, uh, the first, the, the gatekeeper or the first point of contact between a client or potential client and deciding whether to resolve disp a dispute is the solicitor or solicitor advocate. Mm. And it may be that they are in a better position than I am to comment on the frequency. Mm -hmm. I do know that the Law Society of Scotland require uh, solicitors in their code of conduct to give advice about the different methods of dispute resolution available to clients. Mm -hmm. And if no doubt if clients requested information, the solicitor could advise in relation to that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, that's, that's helpful. Um, Robert. Uh, perhaps I could just uh, add to that. I, I think you have to be a little careful about how the different methods relate to each other. If you take, for instance, litigation and arbitration, uh, the, the law says that if you have an arbitration clause and one party insists on resolving the dispute by arbitration, uh, then that will be enforced by the, the courts and to arbitration you must go, as, as one judge uh, put it. Uh, on the other hand, the parties do have the option, if they both think that the particular matter, perhaps it's a technical legal point, mm -hmm. uh, and they want it resolved by a judge, they can agree between themselves to go uh, to court. 
Uh, in terms of mediation, uh, I, I think it, it is quite regularly uh, discussed. It's usually discussed against the background of trying to resolve matters because I think sometimes people have the impression that the whole function of lawyers is to generate as much litigation as possible in order to make as much money as possible. But if you have unhappy clients at the end of it, it's actually a very short-term view. Uh, so actually, I suspect many lawyers spend much of their time trying to persuade parties that there are other things to do other than fight forever in, in some expensive forum, whether it's an arbitration or a, a litigation. And that inevitably leads you to is there another way of resolving this? Mm -hmm. uh, the simplest method, as John has said, is to negotiate a solution. Mm -hmm. And if you can negotiate a solution, why should you do anything else? Mm -hmm. But it may not be possible. There may be personalities. There may be people taking positions. It wouldn't mm -hmm. be unusual. Mm -hmm. in, in which case, uh, one option may be mediation. Uh, but the point with mediation, I, I think, certainly, is a quite common view is that compulsory mediation is a bit of a contradiction in terms. It's something you should opt to do because either you or your advisors think it's the right thing. You shouldn't really be forced into it. So I think it is probably fair to say that finding a solution is always, always discussed and mediation will come in depending on the other options. Thank you. I'll bring in Liam MacArthur just on the small point you're picking up. Mr. Connell's covered some of what I was going That's to ask. Fine. So I well, can move on to, to John, Andrew, and then um, Heloise. To, to respond, if I may, to one of Mackay's question, I think in, in some ways you've identified the key uh, to, to all of this. And I think the key is that those with disputes in Scotland are able to make informed choices. Uh, and I've no doubt that the uh, provision of information is better now than it has perhaps ever been. I have no doubt that many advisors now include in their advice to clients that there are options other than litigation. However, I think it is fair to say in Scotland that the prevailing culture where matters become disputatious and are not capable of easy negotiation is to default to adversarial processes. And in the adversarial process, as Robin was, was hinting at earlier on, people inevitably set out their positions and are, are involved in the, in the sort of paradigm of establishing right against wrong. And you, you have this kind of um, win-lose approach. Now, I would suggest, and this may be where one becomes a little bit more tendentious, that there are significant societal, economic, business and community benefits for Scotland if we could move towards a more consensual culture in which more disputes are dealt with cooperatively, consensually and therefore by negotiation, aided or otherwise. The phrase I hear more than any other as a mediator is, I wish we'd had this conversation a year ago. And these are often experienced uh, people, clients, <laughs> business people, parties, uh, individuals who are involved in significant litigation who discover that in the course of a day they can indeed resolve their disputes but have spent a considerable amount of time and incurred a lot of emotional and other stress and disproportionate cost. And I'm, I'm considered in what I'm about to say but I'm pleased to be able to put it on the record and I know that people will say it's a special pleading but I'm going to try and distance myself from that. I am frequently shocked at the disproportionate amount which parties, including many lay people, have incurred in costs in litigation prior to achieving a solution to that litigation, which it seems to them and others on the day might have been achieved at much less cost and with much less stress and anxiety. So it seems to me that there's the possibility in Scotland to move towards a more consensual approach to many disputes, not by any means all, uh, and that if we can invite, inform, encourage and advise people with disputes to use a range of options, including particularly, as Robin described, interest-based negotiation, by which he means people are able to work out what they really need and really want and find the intersection of that. That will be a good thing. Uh, mediation uh, is never compulsory in the sense that you can never compel, even if people are encouraged or even uh, compelled to use mediation, you can never compel them to agree. They can still decide in that process not 
to reach an agreement and use other processes if they wish to do so. So I think the provision of information about that, Ronnie, is really important. I think other stimuli, other incentives may be necessary to bring Scotland to a place where so many other jurisdictions have reached. Helpful. Now I'm aware there's a number of members want to come, but I'm going to um, go to the, the witnesses just to hear what they have to, to say first. So Heloise and then, oh sorry, Andrew, Heloise, then Robin. Yes, I'll add on the question, I mean I think John's right, there's more information now about mediation arbitration than there has been, but I, I do still think that there's more to do in, in educating uh, the wider public about the options and indeed encouraging solicitors to do more. Uh, to make sure that they are very clear on the different options uh, for their clients. As Angela said, solicitors do have a duty to ensure that they are explaining the different options. Um, but I, I think there is a, a need for more, and, and maybe even going back to universities and ensuring that at the, the time of the law degree that um, those students are, are, are being better uh, made aware of the options and not just the usual focus on litigation, which you tend to find during the, the diploma, for example. Thank you. Heloise? I think a lot of what, um, what I was going to say has probably already been covered. I just wanted to add to the point about mandatory um, mediation. Um, Edinburgh Sheriff Court Mediation Service, um, if a sheriff makes a referral to the service, it's mandatory for the parties to speak to me as the coordinator and receive information. And it's always very clear from that point on that mediation is one choice um, among other choices. Um, I just wanted to uh, add as well um, as to what John said. Um, I find a lot of the cases that I deal with are more suited to mediation um, than litigation, maybe possibly. They don't have a lot of evidence. There's a lot of um, emotion there. Sometimes people just want an apology. Um, and um, it enables people to meet on an even basis as it's set up for party litigants. There's some cases in the court where one party is represented and the other um, party is not. Um, so I think um, with the mediations, um, we have about seven, um, about 75% are successful, but it's always stressed right from the beginning that it, that it is a choice. And as long as the information is there, um, and people always have the option, even after the mediation, of going back to court again. Um, but I do we track courses um, cases after um, after they go to mediation, we find a lot about 50% of those cases, even if they don't settle at mediation, do settle later and don't don't reach proof yeah. evidential hearing. Can I just ask? You mentioned apologies, and since I've got a particular interest in that, are people aware of the apologies act, and has that helped encourage them to um, to seek mediation, to come forward, to give an apology? Mm -hmm. I haven't ha I haven't had experience of that so far, but no, that's something More I work to look be out done. for. <laughs> Then, and uh, Liam Kerr, sorry, oh sorry, Robin next, I always give the, the witnesses the first shot and then I'll bring in Liam and then Marie and Daniel and then go back to Rona. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I was really going to comment on the, the compulsory part as well, but uh, I think we would find amongst the mediation community in Scotland there is agreement that mediation itself should not be compulsory. Um, but where you find the word coming in in relation to mediation is usually about people having information. And there's a, an article in one of the papers that you have from Relationships Scotland, uh, their appendix from um, Stuart Valentine, uh, is about people uh, having information before they go on. And quite a lot of jurisdictions, I think, do require that people get information about mediation uh, so that aspect of compulsion, I think, is generally felt as acceptable, but compulsion actually to go to mediation is not. And we do come into issues about the, uh, the way that simple procedure has actually been carried out in the courts recently, in that I don't think there's uh, yet a good understanding uh, that when a sheriff asks people to go to mediation, it really needs to be to go to find out more about mediation rather than to determine their case through mediation. Um, it might be worth mentioning at this point that in relation to simple procedure, the Scottish, Scottish Mediation is holding a seminar uh, tomorrow evening uh, which will involve sheriffs um, and others, who, the Scottish Government, uh, to look into and explore uh, the last year of using simple procedure and the ADR uh, clause 
in relation to that, which generally means going to mediation, and how we can improve that. And any member of this committee that might be interested in uh, joining us at that would be welcome to come. It's at five o'clock tomorrow. Julie noted. <laughs> uh, Angela, and then I'll bring in Liam Kerr. I wonder if I could draw the committee's attention to a very significant event which is going to be taking place in Edinburgh in 2020. It's called ICA 2020, which stands for the International Council for Commercial Arbitration. I understand it is the arbitration world's equivalent of the Olympics, and the Scottish Arbitration Centre secured the bid, competed with a number of very high-profile venues, there is mention of this in their written submission to the committee. But this uh, is, in the world of arbitration, all eyes will be on Edinburgh. And it is an amazing opportunity for us here and in Scotland generally to showcase our talents in relation to arbitration. And I think it's very important that we all work together. Uh, this year in April, there is the official handover in Sydney, Australia, and the Dean of Faculty will be attending along with other members of faculty. And certainly FOA Arbitration, the special interest group in faculty in arbitration, do wish to assist generally over the next two years in promoting the event because the profile of arbitration will be raised. Right, well that's helpful to know, but I suppose today we're drilling down on why arbitration and what the advantage is. Liam. Thank you, Convener. A number of uh, the witnesses have suggested that compulsory mediation would not be the way to go. Uh, so the question is, was mandatory conciliation in the employment tribunal the right way to go, given that it has a very high success rate and there would obviously be savings to the parties uh, and to the public purse? And if mandatory conciliation in the employment tribunal was the right way to go, then why doesn't that extend to other forms of Litigation. Who'd like to run with that one, John? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think this is a topic that the the, the committee should wrestle with. Um, I have, I think, an open mind about this point personally. Uh, there are significant costs attached to a justice system. Uh, when people choose to litigate, they incur and cause others to incur, including taxpayers, the costs of the justice system. If it is the case, and the evidence suggests that it's so, that the use of mediation, for example, can help to resolve a very large percentage of cases which might otherwise be in the civil justice system, there is at least an argument to be, or a, a topic to be discussed about whether or not people should be um, encouraged, incentivised, or even compelled to try that process in advance of using the justice system, which is their entitlement under Article 6 of the Human Rights Convention. Um, so I think you raise a point that's worthy of consideration, and I repeat the point I made before, that in encouraging, incentivizing, or compelling people to try mediation, no one is forcing them to achieve a settlement or reach an agreement, for that could not be done. I think there are public interest and financial interest reasons for discussing the issue, and the, the committee should do so. Uh, in saying this, I think that I express a view that in many jurisdictions that has been a necessary interim step to encouraging the greater use of voluntary mediation over the longer term. Robin? Uh, following up on that point, um, that sometimes in mediation there's a process by which if, if the parties have not come to an agreement by the end of the mediation, that the mediator can be asked to give some evaluation of the situation. And, and in a way, that's stepping outside that interest-based arrangement and moving more towards a, a, a judgment. Um, and I think that, as John says, these are areas to be explored, uh, but I think that the, the interest-based mediation because it is in the interests of the parties that you're trying to find a resolution, will need to be voluntary. That part of it needs to be voluntary. Um, and it's only uh, after that that one could step aside from uh, the mediation and, and the mediator takes on a slightly different role. <coughs> okay. 
And Craig, on the same point? Yeah, I, I was just going to say that um, I, I do believe there is a, an importance in having um, a concept of provision of a court justice system which is accessible to all and available in an effective uh, way and forcing people not to go there uh, it seems to be to be at least uh, a challenging uh, issue and I do agree with the comments about the voluntary nature. I'm afraid there have been quite a few instances uh, that I hear about anecdotally in uh, England and Wales where people have gone to mediation because they're told they have to. Uh, there's then a cost involved in that, there's a process, the mediator has to be paid, there's often lawyers involved, so they go through a process at the end of which they're really just no further forward. Um, and it's also sometimes used as a tactical device to try and winnow out something from the opposition during the process without ever in, any intention of, of settling. So I think there are arguments, I don't think there's a simple answer to it. I, I had occasion to discuss this with um, uh, Lord Tyre from the Court of Session at an event I was at um, and asked him the direct question about, you know, should you be pushing um, mediation? Now, he's dealing with commercial disputes in the court of session, so possibly at one end of, of the spectrum, and his view was no, that he, he regards the business community as his customers, and he was looking to create a system which was effective and effect giving decisions in the way that the customers wanted. And, the commercial court is very good at that. And the only thing he did say was that as soon as he saw a dispute in front of him, which looked like a corporate dispute, but seemed to be you know, two brothers fighting with each other, he immediately said that this is one you might want to think about other methodologies of resolving because fighting to the death in the courts might not be the right uh, way forward. So uh, I, I, my own view for what it's worth is it's horses for courses. That there, there are cases where uh, the courts may be the best solution. Uh, somebody may not have done something they should have done, um, and the other party is deprived of that if they're forced into some form of compromise. And there are other cases where a much more constructive solution can be achieved by negotiation or mediation. Was it a particular point in, on what Craig's just said? I mean... Yes, well, I, I, I'm not readily persuaded that that answers my question, because the, the, the point that I seek to make is simply that if we accept that the reduction of the cost of the public purse, uh, re reduction of cost of the parties and increased success rates are the end games, then one would have to conclude that bringing in a mandatory prerequisite in the employment tribunal of some form of conciliation has succeeded. And if you start from that point, why wouldn't you at least consider extending the same principle to other forms of litigation? It is. Is that something you'd want to respond to, Craig? Or? Well, um, the, the, I, I'm not, I don't think I have all the answers, uh, and I don't pretend to, to have uh, all the answers. Uh, I, I think my, my own view is actually mediation uh, is less used where it be, could be most effective, which is actually in smaller disputes and disputes involving individuals where their personal feelings and concerns are uh, particularly heightened, perhaps, by what, what, what has happened. Uh, whereas in the main, mediation has tended to focus on providing a provision to the commercial world, at least that's where it started. It's extended, as one of the speakers has said, into other areas now. Now, it may be that in the majority of employment disputes, which are essentially concerning an individual's rights, uh, one can push people in, into a, a negotiation, um, in which case that may be very effective. I'm afraid I can't comment on whether that is a good thing or, or a bad thing, but I, I still uh, maintain the view that forcing people to go through a compulsory mediation process before they get access to the courts is quite a, a, a difficult uh, issue. Uh, that they, uh, The committee are probably aware of the recent litigation over employment tribunal fees that reached the Supreme Court in which there was a long judgment about the importance of access to justice and how anything that stood in the way of access to justice was uh, potentially unlawful uh, and indeed uh, also uh, statements from that court as to why the um, everybody benefits from the existence of a justice system. It's not simply A and B who happen to be engaged in, in a dispute who, who uh, benefit from it, but everybody benefits from the existence of an efficient system. So there are, I think there's some quite nuanced questions here. Uh, I, I, I take the point uh, from an employment lawyer to to my right uh, uh, that um, 
compulsory reference to uh, ACAS it is a system that has been tried and has been proved to be uh, successful. Uh, I, I've no doubt that he's right about that. Okay, and John, did you want to pick up on that point before I bring Ben, then Marion? Chair, to um, clarify, there are others in the room better placed than I, but Craig Connell refers to mediation having started predominantly in the commercial field in Scotland. There is a lot of mediation in the commercial world, but there is a considerably greater amount of mediation in other fields. And it started, I think, in Scotland, probably in the family area back in 1985. And there's reference to this in the papers before you. There's a huge amount, and others here can speak more eloquently about this, in the community sphere, in the neighbourhood sphere, relationships, employment, and so forth and so on. So the committee should not, in any sense, uh, feel that mediation has been used uh, solely or principally in the commercial field. And that's, that's just a matter of, of information. There is one point I think I'd like to pick up on what Craig has just said, because I think, again, this strikes at the heart of much of the discussion. And that is that there is a benefit to society more widely in a justice system and in compelling people to use the courts. Now, well, I can understand in theory that proposition, but think about each individual case. Why should each individual litigant be compelled to use a court system for the benefit of the wider society if that individual litigant could find an easier, more effective and quicker way of resolving disputes by negotiation? So I think we have to be careful about the preservation of a system for its own sake uh, and compare that to the recognition of the needs uh, and the, the value for individuals of having a more effective system. And one final point for information, there, is a huge number, there are a huge number of English cases of high authority discussing all of these points that we're discussing just now about the principle of mediation, about access to justice, about the Human Rights Convention, Article 6, about costs, about incentive, about compulsion. Not just English cases, but cases around the world. You are just exploring things at the moment, I know initially. So I just suggest that, that might be an area for, just for, for further exploration. That, that's helpful. Ben. Thank you, convener, and good morning all. I'm still registered uh, on the role of Scottish solicitors, and, and before uh, coming to this uh, place, I practised for a brief time. And m most of that was in commercial contract drafting. And I think the points raised about solicitors being the gatekeepers, uh, well, perhaps that's a bit uh, too... too too far, but certainly having a, a significant role in guidance is so important. And I wonder if we need to shift the conversation into the initial contract drafting and when people are actually coming to agreements to think about how if uh, those relationships break down wh where, the, where the preferred avenues are. For example, I think of a contract that I worked on where there was a, a clause that Ob oblige the parties to consider arbitration uh, and, and uh, after a certain period. And that gave us uh, leverage to think about, well, if they didn't want to, to use arbitration, perhaps uh, an expert could be involved, which I think uh, Craig Connell mentioned earlier. So my first question is, do we need to think about more at the conception of agreements rather than focus on the end? And also, do we need to view disparate resolution beyond the, 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 the main categorizations of mediation and arbitration and think about the role of legal opinions and other creative ways in which solicitors and other, uh, others in practice are, are trying to, to, to resolve disputes. A mother question, which I think we may come on to later, but I'll just, uh, while I'm speaking, uh, would like to raise it is, are there spheres where we can think more creatively around how we could use alternative dispute resolution affecting not just commercial contracts, but uh, other issues around communities, as, as John Sturrock mentioned. For example, I'm uh, looking at the moment at how we try to assist uh, owners and uh, owner occupiers of tenement flats to, to, to undertake communal work in their, in their properties. Is that a place where, you know, for example, alternative dispute resolution could, could play an important role. So quite a, a lot of, 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 of different points there, but I think it's all useful for the discussion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Robin. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ben. That, um, those two points, I think, are, are very useful ones. The, the first one on the conception of the agreement, I, I think that 
it would be very valuable if a mediation clause went into contracts at an early stage, um, and it sometimes does. Uh, there are um, examples around the world of um, mandates or uh, pledges that are uh, made uh, by organisations to put mediation into their contracts. And uh, Scottish Mediation has a plan to uh, introduce a, a Scottish Mediation Charter on a voluntary basis for organisations in Scotland and encourage them to, as part of that charter, uh, to put mediation clauses into their contracts. I think there's a, there's a lot that could be explored in that and how that could be supported by, by legislation. Just picking up on the other areas, uh, there are, I think, a, a lot of other areas, and sometimes they are discovered by organisations that provide a mediation for one purpose. Um, anyone uh, who um, looks at Friends of the Scotland will see that our director, who's sitting at the back here, uh, was in the Friends of uh, last, last week, I think it was, or the week before. Um, and he was writing in it about um, community uh, mediation organisation uh, that has started to get involved in uh, owner-occupied problems of community. Uh, agreement on carrying out repairs, so exactly the thing that you're talking about. So where something started out as a mediation service for neighbour disputes has moved into that area, and in some councils uh, it has moved into workplace mediation as well. So uh, as mediation moves into an organisation, the organisation starts to find ways that it can be used. and so the ingenuity of organisations uh, starts to come into play in using the skill of, of mediators, not necessarily with a full mediation, but in terms of what I describe as a mediating way of dealing with difference and issues so that they don't escalate. So I think it's a very valuable contribution. Andrew, then Angela. Yeah, I think uh, Ben makes a very good point about contracts. I mean, that, that is effectively uh, the agreement um, where it, which should determine what the dispute resolution mechanism is going to be. It's not about, I'm afraid, putting in a mediation clause. I come back to making sure that those that are drafting understand what the contract is about, what the agreement is about, and therefore what would be best suited for the parties, or indeed their client, in respect of that uh, agreement. It might be mediation. It might be mediation and arbitration. You can have a tiered clause, or the view might be that it should be litigation. Um, so I, I come back to the point um, that it's about making sure our practitioners, contract drafters, understand the differences and are able to advise uh, properly. Uh, and we certainly um, find it more challenging uh, to get to contract drafter lawyers who are generally not interested in dispute resolution matters. Um, uh, it, we, we, we find it more difficult to get to them to persuade them to think about this particular clause which might be in a 300 uh, page uh, contract uh, and, and pointing out the value uh, of, of, of taking some time to think about the consequences of what goes in that agreement uh, because if there is a dispute that is what will count what's in that uh, contract uh, uh, clause. So I, I think that point is well made and it's something we, I think, have to do more to, to, to get general counsel of companies, uh, so in-house lawyers, but also private practice uh, contract drafters to think more about uh, what they're putting in contracts. Angela? I think the committee should be cautious about seeking to limit the choice open to clients or potential clients. At the point of either entering the contract or at the point of a dispute arising where there may not be a contract, I think it's important for each individual to consider all the options available and to make a, an informed decision about what the best option is for them. The key is, in my view, education and raising awareness and allowing people to find that information. And it's how best to do that. Uh, one of the examples which may be of interest to you relates to personal injury arbitration. Now, personal injury work is very commonly conducted 
through the courts and litigated. And FOA arbitration are promoting and raising awareness about the possibilities of arbitration as a means of resolving personal injury claims. And this has actually been used very effectively in Scotland in the past, after the Piper Alpha disaster. And many of the claims by men who were injured uh, during the Piper Alpha disaster 30 years ago were resolved by personal injury arbitration. But many lawyers in Scotland, both in the faculty and in the solicitor's profession, aren't aware of that and aren't aware that that is a, a method which has been used. And Scotland's unique in that regard. OK, thank you. John? forward and I'm aware that many of us here work predominantly in what would be viewed as the commercial end of the market and you're hearing quite a lot about that. The reality in Scotland however is that most folk with problems and disputes will never get anywhere near a court mm. or a lawyer not least because they don't have the resources but probably also because they don't know about it. So I think it's important to be very aware that there's there are real potential, there's real potential and real need in the commercial community and that's important for business and, and um, the generation of, of, of wealth in, in this country. However, what we're talking about is also about family matters, community matters, neighbourhood matters, small claims as we heard earlier on and these will require different approaches, they have different needs financial, educational, informational and resource. I think the committee would be astute to, to think about the, the, the differences that there are to make the differentiation and, and not to seek to find one size or one approach to fit all. This comes back, I think, to the diversity of all of this, but the real need to focus on the real needs of the people in Scotland who have got disputes. Okay. Mary, and then I'll bring Rona back with her substantive point of uh, thank you, convener. It was really just to go back to some of the comments that were made earlier, and I, I'm just interested in the differences of approach, you know, the consensual versus the, the adversarial. Um, I know that earlier on in the meeting when we first started, uh, Mr Connell, you, you talked about how we wouldn't want to see a situation similar to that uh, that, uh, that operates in England and Wales. And it was really, I think, from what I'm picking up, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that I think that the overall impression would be, well, you may not want to see a different system operate in Scotland, but there could be ways we could potentially better utilise the other ADR methods uh, in Scotland. I'd be interested to hear more about how it actually works in England and Wales and to get some of the, the different opinions on that around the table. Anyone want to pick and run with that one? The, the, the only... That's I... Craig say something about the, uh, the English ex experience, uh, not in any great uh, detail, but the, the, the position in England and Wales is broadly that the um, parties in civil litigation are uh, in effect told that they need to mediate under pain of being penalised in costs if they don't. I mean, that, that's a very oversimplified uh, picture and therefore parties even when they think they have a cast iron open and shut case, feel obliged to go through a process in order to avoid the ire of the judge later on when they say, why didn't you uh, mediate? Now, John Starrett would tell you there's no case that can't be mediated to a solution and maybe in a theory, theoretical sense uh, that, 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 that is uh, correct. I think it's just a question of, I, I would endorse the view about horses for courses. There was a mention of family mediation. Now, Every day of the week we get decisions from the courts which say A is right, B is wrong. And in many cases that is what's necessary because that is what has to be decided. Uh, but if you take, say, a dispute uh, um, following family breakdown, on which I don't pretend to be an expert, but it's pretty obvious, I think, that in many of these disputes where there are children and money and so forth, there is no winner, uh, no loser, or there ought not to be, and therefore there's great scope for family mediation uh, to be effective there. Um, I'd also just like to endorse what Andrew said about the difficulty of getting to the contract drafters. Um, I'm forever trying to persuade contract drafters to listen to people like me who've been through the humps and bumps of the consequences of not getting it uh, right. Uh, and it, it is 
quite difficult, uh, and the psychology is quite simple. If you're entering into a contract, the last thing you want to think about is things going wrong. You, you're actually being positive, you're about to do the deal, things are great, shake hands, get the paperwork done, um, and then along comes somebody who said, have you thought about your dispute resolution clause? What should you put into it? Uh, I have to say that there are some more sophisticated versions now which uh, require sort of tiers. You know, first, you know, the managing director of each company should meet to try and achieve a solution, second, third, and so, and so on. So th there are some more elaborate versions uh, out there, but it is quite a challenging uh, task to persuade people to focus on that early. And then, of course, every dispute doesn't arise from a contract. Uh, so that, that, that deals with one particular aspect, but not, uh, not uh, everyone. It's, but it, it still does come back, I think, as John said, to this issue between treating mediation uh, as a system which works best if the parties have agreed to be there and want to be there, and mediation being sort of thrust upon people when they don't want it. That's still, I think, one of the issues that's out there for discussion. Yeah, family law has been mentioned, and of course there, there is scope for that, but we're very conscious here that in all cases in family law, those, for example, um, which involve domestic abuse, wouldn't be appropriate. So if we get that out of the way, then we know what we're talking about when we're talking about family law. Uh, John? Yeah. I think, Mary, if I may, you raise a, a very legitimate question. Um, sometimes in Scotland we're a bit wary about looking south of the border for, for help, but there's a lot of information to be obtained. Uh, since the late 90s, um, the English civil justice system has been much more inclined towards, find ways, towards finding ways for early dispute resolution. And that's incorporated in the rules of court and the way in which judges approach cases and the encouragement and information given to clients. I think, with great respect to Craig, it's, it's actually much more nuanced and now sophisticated than he might have characterised it as being. If you have a completely cast iron case, very few are completely cast iron or they wouldn't be litigated, then you have nothing to fear from the English approach. The English approach is that if you unreasonably refuse to participate in mediation, having been encouraged by a court to do so, then that may have some implications for expenses or costs, as they call them in England. And that's a way of trying to adjust the, the risk balance, if you like, if people choose not to try something which, which might be useful for them. The re reality is that in England it is well established that many, by no means all, many cases will go to mediation. Um, the, the structure is set up to accommodate that. The information and research shows repeatedly over the years that in 85 to 90 percent of instances that produces a settlement and the parties are out of the court system, everybody's happy. Of course, every now and again it doesn't work. And of course that will have incurred some additional cost. But even there, what we tend to find, or what they tend to find, is that it has greatly enlarged their knowledge of the case. It may often have uh, reduced the scope of the issues in discussion. Very often cases settle many months thereafter because of further thought. But what it does is it helps to focus the issues in the case. So of course it's not perfect. I mean, the benchmark here is, uh, I mean, to what extent might a new approach be at least marginally more effective and helpful for clients than the present approach, amongst a range of options. And, and in some cases, quite understandably and quite rightly, we'll still go to court. But the committee needs to be mindful that in Scotland, even of those cases in the court system, I think only about 5% are actually adjudicated upon, decided by a judge. There are questions about the use of resources, even in that statistic. So I think, again, it's much more nuanced. There's much more to be discussed. And you're right to have a look south of the border at what they've experienced. Robin? I was thinking uh, into the, the future of things that could be done in Scotland. And I think one of, one of the areas is when legislation is being examined up here to see uh, where mediation might be uh, relevant to it. And, and two of the, I think, successful areas of uh, mediation, and successful in terms of its uh, take up and use, have been the Scottish Legal Complaints Commission uh, where there's a, a section in the, the legislation about mediation and also in relation to young people's special education needs uh, where there's a section about uh, mediation. So I think uh, providing within legislation for uh, mediation can be a constructive way uh, of the Parliament uh, adding to uh, 
what's there. And maybe, in a way, taking away some of the obstacles uh, that get in the way. The obstacle, really, uh, being is just not well known uh, in many cases. And it does help to raise its profile and, and make it available. Okay. Liam and then George Adam and small points related. Liam MacArthur. Oh, right. uh, thanks very much. Just um, a, a couple of points. One on the commercial side. Um, it, it occurred to me when um, a, a number of witnesses were speaking there that in terms of the contract, presumably, um, I, I think it's right that the psychology in, in, in the drafting of a contract isn't envisaging it, it, its failure, but nevertheless, the insurers of a, a, a company presumably will have an interest in ensuring that um, those, th those aspects of the contract uh, are written in, in a way that minimises the potential risk to the company. So uh, is there a way of exploring it through, um, through a, an appeal to the, the, the interests of, uh, of insurers? And in relation to the, the, the family um, uh, situation, I think, Camino, you quite rightly um, cautioned uh, uh, against too um, broad brush and approach and that the, the, the issues around domestic abuse are, are clearly uh, ones that would need to be handled with great sensitivity. But I think in terms of relationship breakdown, breakdown and divorce, it is invariably suggested that the only winners in that are the, the lawyers. And I can imagine that, um, that, that uh, many will, will make um, uh, strenuous efforts to dissuade their, their clients of going down a route that is simply going to bog them down in, in, in more emotional and financial um, uh, difficulties. But nevertheless, having some firmer requirement around mediation would at least strengthen the hand of solicitors that this is something that that, uh, that, that clients would need to um, uh, consider perhaps more more seriously than they, they, they often currently do because they are so fixated in in getting back at the at, at, at their other partner so is that something that we could perhaps find a way um, recognizing the, the nuances in all this but find a way of maybe um, reinforcing a little more and Andrew will be coming in. George, you want to raise your point just at this, this juncture? Indeed. Uh, what, so what Craig already mentioned earlier on as well, I'm, I'm trying to look at it from a practical point of view and what we've done in the constituency. And uh, one of the things we did was uh, the purchase, community purchase of the local football team, St Murna FC, where there were 1,300 fans put money into a pot, working with another. Now, the lawyers kept saying to us, what if things go wrong? What if, uh, how are you going to deal with this? You know, have you look at res some kind of resolution, dispute resolution? And we were of the mind there, let's just get the deal done. Get the deal done. Everything's rosy. 1,300 people have backed it. Let's, let's move things forward. So I think when we look at some of the stuff we've got here from Spice, it says, uh, are the gatekeepers the solicitors? Well, in a lot of cases, in my experience, they've actually given you the advice, but you're at the stage where you're saying, I need this to progress, I need this to move forward as well. And I've taken it on. This 10-year programme is going to be something I'm going to have to manage over the next 10 years. But the other thing is, and what John was talking about in the normal day-to-day -day constituency stuff, where mediation happens and people get involved, but a lot of constituents and members of the public actually see mediation as a block to get the resolution. They don't feel they get the buyout. They don't get the benefit of it. They feel that, oh, I've got to go through this in order to, before I can actually get some kind of resolution on the issue. And that's another way when we're looking at, I suppose they're both connected, buy into the whole idea of uh, mediation in itself. Okay, Andrew, on, on some of this. On, on the family uh, mediation, I, I mean, I actually think that's one of the, the, the success stories in Scotland is, is that there has been uh, a move uh, towards mediation in family uh, cases and there's bodies like Relationship Scotland involved in, in that work. And I actually think practitioners involved in family law um, are, are quite aware of the options around mediation and I think it's always at the, the forefront of their mind, but it's not always the right way to go. Um, and there are a number of family practitioners who will tell you that, for example, arbitration might be right for their clients. And indeed, uh, Flags, who submitted a, uh, a submission to the, the committee, talks about family law arbitration. Equally, it might be that uh, litigation has to be considered. I think, I think the general point is that um, it, it has to be about options, and each case will be different. Um, in the case of family where there's just no way that the two uh, people involved 
want to even be in the same room, it's going to be difficult to mediate. Uh, equally, they might not want to go to court because they might not want their, uh, their private uh, business being discussed in public. So, for example, arbitration might be an alternative that allows an actual decision to take place uh, where they can't themselves come to any sort of uh, mediated decision. So I, I think it's, it's all about uh, making sure people have the options and not, I think, requiring people to always go down one particular route. Liam, briefly. Just, yeah. uh, just on, I mean, I, I think you're absolutely right. Again, I, I, I've declared my interest as, as, uh, as somebody who has connections with Relationship Scotland. I know the, the work they do and, and, and how that has expanded. But is it fair to say that it, it may still be patching the way that referrals are made to, to, to mediation in, in family circumstances? I mean, are there particular sheriffs um, that are, are more predisposed to it and, and, and may even lay a, an, an expectation on what he or she expects um, that, that, that um, route to, to achieve? But Heloise, I know, is one that's come in, unless you particularly want to respond to that. Heloise? Okay, I just wanted to firstly go back to the comment about um, mediation being um, a barrier to clients getting a, um, getting a resolution uh, to the case. Um, I found my experience in the simple procedure court, um, quite a few of the party litigants have quite an unrealistic idea of what, how the court system is structured and what it can actually um, do for them. Um, I find a lot of, um, a lot of clients don't realise how difficult it is going to be to get their decree, the amount of evidence you know, that is required... Um, which is, I suppose it comes back to getting information and advice, and we do have an advice system that we refer people to, to as well. Um, so I, th I think that can be about. I think once people are more aware of the, di the di not just mediation, but of the reality of litigation as well, and also going back to the comment about um, sort of patchy referrals, um, I've generally found. I mean, the sheriffs at Edinburgh tend to be very pro mediation. I think judicial encouragement can be very important encouraging people to go to mediation um, as long as that's not seen as, as it being mandatory. But um, that's, you do have a dedicated uh, mediation unit there. It's not the case in, throughout Scotland. So. No, I mean, there's also one in, in, in Glasgow. Right. Um, but I find since the simple procedure rules were brought in, um, I don't think there's been a... Um, I think different courts seem to be taking very very different approaches to the, to the rules. Okay. I'll bring in Colin and then I'll move on to um, Rona's substantive point. And we can take it from okay. um, I'd like to pick up on uh, Liam MacArthur's uh, question there. I, I, th I think it's important to, to recognise that even in family cases, uh, the majority are not litigated at all. So most family um, situations resolved by way of negotiation and settlement and it's actually a minority which end up uh, in the courts uh, in any form and then possibly a minority of those which end up uh, being mediated. Uh, the court has long had the power to refer parties to mediation in family cases and I think that is why mediation has gained uh, a bit of a foothold uh, in, in family work. Um, I think it probably is patchy. Uh, I think there, there are probably um, enthusiasts for, for mediation, both amongst uh, some local bars and some sheriffs, and certainly um, many, many years ago when we started funding mediation uh, through legal aid, we monitored uh, the take-up of that, and there were definitely hot spots in certain places, and you could identify individual practitioners uh, who had made it a priority, uh, and individual sheriffs uh, who certainly emphasised the benefits of mediation uh, in their local courts, and that encouraged more take-up uh, at a local level. In terms of uh, in encouraging it or, or, or trying to um, make people aware of, of mediation as an option rather than ploughing on to, to litigation, uh, obviously we, we, I suppose, uh, perform some sort of gatekeeper role uh, in terms of applications for legal aid uh, for litigation, which is another subset of, of, the, of the, the whole uh, picture. Um, but for applications for legal aid to litigate family matters, we do ask the parties before we'll grant legal aid what efforts they've made uh, to negotiate, to try and find a settlement, or if they've considered mediation. But we've got to be mindful uh, of the appropriate balance of not standing in the way of people appropriately uh, litigating where that is the right thing for them to do. So mindful of trying to avoid becoming a barrier ourselves, we do, however, put it to the parties that they, they should be considering considering um, whether mediation is an option for them. Uh, and for, for, for some, it undoubtedly is. Uh, for some, um, they don't see it as being for them. Uh, and I think part of the experience uh, of mediation is that actually it's, it's hard work for the parties. 
um, they, they may get more out of it in the sense that you know, what they put in they may get back in terms of uh, a more lasting relationship, uh, a resolution that works for, for, for each of them in the sense that there's no win or lose. It's, it's trying to find a, a mutual uh, solution. But they have to give of themselves to that process uh, in a way that many might feel they don't have to, to litigation process uh, where their, their solicitors might be, be seen to be doing battle for them. Um, but it's certainly, I think, particularly where there are emotional uh, issues involved, it's quite difficult for the party to do that and some may be reluctant to do it. Uh, I'm going to ask Rona to come in at this point because there's a substantive area that we haven't covered. We'd like to hear more evidence about it. Rona. Okay, thank you, Convener. Yeah, it's about funding, basically, and there's sort of two strands to, to my question. One is the funding framework. How is arbitration and mediation, how, how is it funded? Um, we've heard it can save the public purse money and presumably reduce legal aid costs, but basically just how does that work? And then the second question is, does it cost a client less to go to arbitration or mediate than to litigate? If we'd like to just bring up the funding issue and um, address that. Robin? Uh, I'll just focus on fun, the, the issues in relation to the simple procedure. Um, we've had uh, from Eloise uh, a contribution about what's happening in the Edinburgh Sheriff Court. And uh, the only funding uh, that goes into that is the funding for the coordination of the service and prov uh, prov provision of that. Um, the mediators that work there are doing it all on a pro bono basis. Um, if what one looks at the west coast of Scotland, uh, the uh, Strathclyde University, uh, through their mediation clinic, provide a service in seven different uh, sheriff courts. They've done uh, over 70, between 70 and 80 mediations uh, through the period of simple procedure. Um, all of that work is being done on a pro bono basis and the coordination is being subsidized through the uh, University of Strathclyde. Elsewhere in Scotland, uh, as far as I'm aware, there's no uh, mediation service other than to refer uh, people to Scottish Mediation's helpline and the helpline uh, will then refer them to uh, mediators who will make a charge. We're not talking of a, a high charge but it, it, it does present a problem in relation to some courts people are being asked to pay for mediation, other courts they're getting the mediation fee and that we have different arrangements for the coordination of mediation operating across Scotland. So over the course of the last year, it has been quite a mixed bag uh, in terms of funding. The uh, seminar that I, I was referring to tomorrow, uh, where we're going to bring together under the auspices of Scottish mediation, uh, people that are interested in this area, I hope will address some of those issues. Uh, so there is an access to, to justice issue there right away, Angela. Thank you. There is legal aid funding for litigation and mediation, but as I understand it, the current position is that there's no funding from the legal aid board for arbitration, and that does limit the choice of parties. And I think the point that was raised earlier uh, in relation to, for example, domestic abuse situations, where simply the parties there's maybe been control or physical abuse or such like. Parties need a decision to be imposed on them. They cannot reach a resolution themselves. And that would not happen in mediation, but it could happen in arbitration. And there's a significant number of people uh, interested in family law arbitration and working in that field and have, have educated themselves and working towards that. But there is no doubt that a lack of legal aid funding for arbitration does limit the choice of parties and means they are pushed towards litigation if they cannot resolve their disputes through mediation. Colin and then John Finney. 
Um, we've long funded um, mediation, effectively, as an outlay on a solicitor's account, uh, either uh, prior to litigation and advice and assistance or uh, as part of a grant of, of civil legal aid. Uh, we started doing that in, I think it was 1995, 1996, uh, and at that point, um, I think there is a, a great hope that uh, making funding available through legal aid would be the thing that unlocked uh, mediation, that that was the thing that was holding it back. Um, I don't think it was. Um, as I say, we've been doing it now for, for over 20 years, and the take-up has, has not been uh, enormous, as I explained earlier. It's been uh, uh, geographically um, you know, differentiated depending on local cultures or local behaviours by, by, by sheriffs or, or solicitors. And I, I don't think that the availability of that funding is the thing um, that was going to, to allow mediation to, to, to flourish when there are other either structural or cultural uh, barriers to, to, to moving towards uh, uh, mediation. In terms of arbitration... Um, there, are people aware that that funding is available? Would you think part of the problem is a lack of awareness? Well, it's, it's one, of the, one of the tools available uh, to, to solicitors in advising their clients and, and enabling them to make informed choices. So, so again, there it goes back to um, what advice are people being provided with, what options are they being presented with, uh, what preference is being expressed there, if, if, if there's a, a preference to be expressed by, by their advisor. So I, I think awareness generally of it as an option or an understanding of what it might involve uh, might, might hold things back uh, as much, if not more, than the availability of funding or otherwise. Uh, with arbitration, um, we're meeting uh, with faculty uh, on Friday uh, to, to discuss um, uh, arbitration more generally. We previously met with, with, with Andrew and his colleagues, um, but I, I don't think we've ever really had a, a case presented to us for how arbitration could fit into the legal aid system, because mediation exists sometimes alongside litigation, which is what you know the proceedings for which civil legal aid is available, whereas arbitration um, really is an alternative uh, to litigation. It sits distinct uh, from litigation, and therefore uh, it, its ability to be integrated into the legal aid system particularly as it's directed towards litigation, is a bit more of a challenge. So uh, we'll, we will discuss uh, on Friday, and I'd be interested in, in exploring just what the funding mechanism could or should be uh, that would enable arbitration to happen, and, and what, um, I guess, what, what, what rules would have to be placed uh, around that, because obviously we have very detailed rules around access to legal aid funding for litigation, uh, and we'd have to consider what the position would be uh, for arbitration in a similar yeah. way. John Finney, could I have your supplementary and then I'll bring in John Stavik. Thank you, Kadvina. Um, Mr Lancaster, um, some of it's been alluded to already, and that's the, the research that uh, SLAB um, published in 2014. I believe it was based in 2012 um, experience. Um, I, I wonder, first and foremost, um, if there's a catch-22, because one of the findings was a lack of publicity uh, about ADR as an option. Um, I mean, is there a role there for SLAB to promote it? Um, and I wonder, given that the landscape's changed slightly there with the uh, apologies um, being another option, is, is there any plan to review your, your role or do further research on this? We've been involved in, in discussions over many, many years uh, about ADR generally. Uh, it's more often uh, focused on mediation. Uh, I think our experience has been that the, the, there is something there that, that's holding it back. The, the research that we published and others that we've contributed uh, to the Scottish Civil Justice Council's Access to Justice Committee's work uh, on ADR suggests a, a long uh, list of potential barriers, many of which are cultural or knowledge or, or understanding based. I think there are opportunities uh, to use online sources of information where you can present different options alongside each other. Um, and if people are using those uh, as they're initially trying to work out how they might seek to resolve a dispute, uh, then there's no, if, if you like, there's no um, influence being placed on their viewpoint by a particular advisor who might encourage them to go in a partic uh, particular direction or otherwise. The mygov.scot website, which is a, a, a growing and useful resource uh, in terms of information about, well, everyday matters, but, but dispute resolution is there, um, presents information about advice services, legal aid, alternatives to court and court um, alongside each other. 
and there's links there through to, to, to many mediation uh, and, and other uh, ADR organisations. So I, I think that information is out there, um, but I think we have, I think it was, it was John referred to it as a, as a culture where the default mode for many people is to go to see a solicitor, and by the time they're doing that, they've probably already got something in their minds. Uh, and it's very difficult to then move them uh, from that if they've got a particular focus on wanting to, to litigate the matter or being proven, proven right. Uh, and, and that's not really the, 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 the uh, approach that's going to be most amenable to, to mediation. So it's getting that information to people early when they're considering their options before they're part way down a track from which it's quite hard to retreat. Thank you. And then I'm going to ask Liam Keller to come with our final kind of substantive question. I'm very conscious of the clock. We've got about five minutes left. Okay. So, John. Convener, thank you. And I do apologise for calling you chair and chairman earlier on. Um, first of all, in response particularly to Rona Mackay's question, there is evidence available uh, from other jurisdictions about the uh, savings which may accrue from, for example, the use of mediation. And if the committee would like to have access to that, I'd like provide some information if, if possible uh, and the evidence certainly from England is of very substantial savings being made through for example the use of mediation and it would seem to me it'd be useful perhaps to think about whether or not some sort of comparative study could be carried out however I think it's important also not to look at this just from the point of view of finance um, there is a danger that we look at this as a way to save public money and that's an appropriate factor or criterion but of course there are other issues other benefits and other disadvantages of each but I've mentioned myself, stress, anxiety, time, uh, relationships, contracts, and so forth. So all of these would be worthy of consideration. I've suggested in my paper, as one of the recommendations, that Audit Scotland might be invited to carry out some sort of a review of the civil justice system from a value for money point of view. I think that would be interesting to, to develop. Um, can I make a point about what Robin was saying about mediation and the provision of pro bono services? I think that's been great, and people have given a huge amount of time sacrificially over many years. There comes a point, however, if mediation and mediators are to be perceived as a valuable part of the dispute resolution framework, that some value will need to be placed on the provision of those services and some appropriate level of remuneration uh, made available, not least if you want people to develop their skills and their careers in, in that way. Um, I think I wanted to, to just to finish these remarks by picking up on what Colin had said and what I said earlier on. We are back again, however much we discuss this, to consideration of the structural and societal, cultural ways in which we deal with problems in Scotland. And you know, in this very building, there is very often perceived to be a culture of win-lose, of adversarialism, of polarisation, and that gives signals. But of course, we we are in some ways. Um, geared up biologically and psychologically to, for the fight or flight mechanism to prevail, particularly when we're under pressure. So I think it's working with these ideas as well and what it might be to be a, a society in which we can understand how people act and react under pressure, particularly when things become very emotional and how nevertheless we can help people to, to work more effectively. And I, just, I just finish off, you know, that was really the context, I think, of the Apology Act, convener. It was a, an attempt to put a different approach into the culture of problem solving, apology being well recognised as one way of achieving that. So I think what this, this session opens up is all sorts of possibilities and interesting questions for inquiry. Thank you. Right, Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. Uh, for time reasons, I'll ask two very direct, targeted questions, if I may. John Sturrock, um, <clears throat> you talk, quite rightly, in my view, about the nuances and access to justice has come up. Um, do you think that... <clears throat> There is a danger that we talk about access to justice when what we really mean is about access to the courts. I am not sure that the two concepts are mm -hmm. synonymous and are often wrongly conflated, and I'd yeah. be grateful for your thoughts on that. Um, the second question I have I'll put to Robin Burley, uh, although I appreciate others may want to come in. Uh, you talked, Mr Burley, earlier on about how these areas are, are not necessarily well known about. Uh, now, given that they're cheaper than the courts and the solicitors and their success rates appear to be high from the evidence that we've seen, uh, it seems odd to me that people are not availing themselves of this and they don't know about it. A cynic might suggest that the legal profession would be reluctant to recommend, given that they effectively talk themselves out of money. Would the cynic be right? 
As if, Mr. Kerr. And <laughs> um, John, could you start yep. and then Robin? I think you raise, a, you raise a very, very important point, if I may say so, Liam. The issue about justice and what we mean by justice is one that would take up the whole hour and a quarter and more. I think you may be right in that access to justice is perceived rather more narrowly than it could be. I would like to reframe the question, however, and suggest that what we are really considering is availability uh, of early, effective, efficient and useful processes to help people with problems to resolve these problems. Disputes, differences, whatever they may be. Justice has a much wider concept or much wider understanding than merely reference to rights as defined in the law. And that itself is a contentious issue and needs to be discussed further. Okay, and Robin? Thank you. Um, well, I, I don't think the cynic is right. And I would say there's two things that we need. I think one, we need leadership, and the other, we need education. On the leadership one, I think that it would be great if people within the Scottish Parliament availed themselves of the opportunity to learn about mediation, um, to take courses in mediation. It would help us to show that there are other ways of handling uh, difference and dispute. Um, on the education one, I'm leaving here to go to the University of Strathclyde to do some tutoring in mediation. And I'm doing that as part of their diploma course for lawyers. Edinburgh has a diploma course uh, which includes a mediation model, module, Strathclyde does. If we had uh, modules in mediation throughout all the law schools in Scotland, we would see a change coming in. So education, I think, is really uh, key to making the change. <coughs> But, of course, that's a generational thing, uh, and we need leadership now to make the change. And Andrew? Uh, I think you're right about the access to justice point. I think uh, it, you should look at all the different options, and, that, and mediation, for example, uh, it clearly falls within uh, that. Um, and, I, and I also, on the, on the point about costs, um, if you are going to see more mediation, more arbitration, and particularly at that lower levels, trying to keep... Uh, that work out of the courts, uh, then you have to have a way of, of making that, uh, you know, cost effective. And uh, and we have talked a bit about legal aid. Um, you'll not be surprised. I, I don't agree with the slab on arbitration, um, but. I think we need to be a bit more radical and look at things like online dispute resolution. We need to, to look at telephone mediation, for example. Uh, there have been successful schemes elsewhere. Uh, when you think about particularly rural areas where people might have to travel hundreds of miles to their nearest court, I think we need to be thinking seriously about how we ensure that people can get access to dispute resolution, whether it's the court, whether it's mediation or arbitration, and that we have proper ways in which people can, can do that, possibly even from their own home, if you're doing it uh, on a telephone or, or from a computer. So I think we need to be much more radical about ensuring that people do have access to different dispute resolution methods, how that, how that actually happens, you know, do you start to integrate it into the wider court and justice system? It, does it become an option, a sort of triage approach where people get the choice as they come towards the court door about the different options open to them, the different costs involved, because obviously it's going to be cheaper to do a telephone mediation than it is to have somebody in court for a number of days. So I think we need to be quite radical about the options that are there, that are being tested elsewhere in the world, um, and think about the possibilities for using technology uh, to ensure that people do have real access to justice in Scotland. And with that, I'm afraid the, the clock has beaten us. Can I thank all the witnesses for what's been an excellent session? I think ADR or RDR, if we want to refer to it as that, is an area that you know really hasn't been given the prominence it could today, has, has helped um, resolve that to an extent. It's also raised lots of issues, and the panellists will be... Um, We'll be pleased to hear that during our work problem, we'll be looking at these issues and deciding if we want to, to move forward and do some more. In the meantime, thank you all very much for attending. Can I suspend now uh, for a change of witness and have a five minute comfort break?
Agenda item five is an evidence session on remand. The committee previously held uh, one uh, round table session on remand on the 16th of January, and the evidence session today provides the opportunity to explore some of the issues raised then at the round table, but in more depth. Um, I welcome Karen um, McCluskey, Chief Executive, and Keith Gardner, Head of Improvement, both with Community Justice Scotland. Thomas Jackson, Head of Community Justice, Glasgow City Council, representing the Convention of Scottish Local Authorities. Tom Halpin, Chief Executive, Safeguarding Communities, Reducing Offending. And Catherine Lindsay, Chief Social Worker, uh, Worker, sorry, Chief Social Work Officer and member of Social Work Scotland. You're all very welcome. Um, can I thank you, all the witnesses who uh, supplied written uh, submissions. That's always extremely helpful for the committee in advance of an evidence session. And can I refer members to paper four, which is a note by the clerk, and paper five, which is a private paper. And we will now commence with our questioning, starting with Liam Kerr. With who? Oh, sorry, Liam MacArthur. I look at Liam Kerr, I say Liam MacArthur, I say Liam Kerr. I mean, of all the, the committees, both Liam's could end up and it would be justice, wouldn't it? Sorry, Liam MacArthur. Thank you, uh, Kavina. Good morning. Um, I, I just offer a quote from the Scottish Prisons Commission from 2008 where they said, uh, often remands are the result of lack of information or lack of services in the community to support people uh, on bail. I, welcome maybe your reflections on whether things have moved on since then or whether this reflects uh, a view that's uh, still opposite. Uh, Who'd like to start? Mr Jackson? Yeah. Did it come in? I mean, I, th I think it's fair to say we've watched the remand numbers growing, so we haven't seen them reversing. So from that perspective, it is still an issue. Um, whether it's about more information or more support is, is something that could be discussed. But the critical issue is we do have good evidence that where we provide supports in the courts, we see that shift in judi judicial confidence. We see sheriffs making a decision towards bail and towards community options. So we know what we can do to, to shift that. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> There's no doubt the President's Commission at that time reflected what everybody would know what the issue is. I, th I think that fundamentally remains the same. The question you made is a very good one, which is, has it changed since then? And the reality is that people uh, don't comply with bail and, and other conditions um, because of a, a broad range of circumstances. You have to look at the whole picture. Uh, it's not just about, uh, I don't want to comply. And then you look at the availability of those supports that uh, worked with that. And the, and the reality in the answer to your question is across Scotland, that's a, a very uh, a different picture in different bits of the country. We, we do though still have the view that the statement made by the President's Commission is right and is one that we should focus on and stay focused on. If, it, if it's a patchy picture, um, I mean, it's invidious to perhaps pick out e exemplars or, or um, name and shame. But I mean, is there evidence of what those who are getting this right more often are doing um, that others are perhaps not doing? Yeah, uh, um, there, uh, where, where we have, um, in, in the view of SACRO, uh, 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 structured uh, bail supervision services, these are, uh, these are effective. Um, I, I refer to uh, one example where the service in uh, one sheriff court with the full support of the sheriff principal and the sheriffs uh, accepted um, short adjournments to make sure the package was around people, etc. And in uh, just uh, about 13 months, it worked with uh, 30 women. And, and these were women who were selected because they were already going to remand. I mean, the, the adjournment during the, the hearing was because the, the breaches had occurred. You know, the, the DTTOs weren't working. There was a history. And of those 30 women, uh, 25 complied with that uh, support around them. Um, of the five who didn't, four were for breach. One was for other reasons, moving out of the area. Um, so we know there's, a, there's one example, and I could give you uh, many examples where it, it, we know that it's effective and does work. Mm -hmm. And so. Karen? Sorry, I would just say we've obviously a relatively new body. We've been looking around Scotland just now. In terms of demand and in knowing that I was coming to the evidence committee today, I spent some time in the custody courts. 
we are absolutely dealing with the most damaged and chaotic in our community. Bail supervision is not going to be the only thing. Most of them live in chaotic accommodation, bed and breakfasts, you know, letters don't follow them from one place to another. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to have to look slightly wider for some of the solutions to this. Colleagues will be obviously be aware on, you know, the work that's going around homelessness, and we seem to be able to occupy opposing moral universes around this. We look at remand, and we're dealing with the same people that often we're dealing with in homelessness, and indeed one leads to the other. Many of the rough sleepers have just come out of jail. So we, I think some of the evidence based from some of the housing first model, where we put people in a home, Maslow's hierarchy of needs would say that these are the most essential things for people to have a stable background and, and you know, reduce some of the more abhorrent and, and damaging behaviours. We don't have that yet. And I think if you look at the cases in the court, you know, and absolutely people who are the most dangerous in the, our communities will need to be remanded. But the chaotic, we absolutely do need to think of different ways to deal with them. And the picture is very patchy around the country. I hate to use the word postcode justice, but you know, there is, in some areas you will go, you know, you may be diverted, you may have, you know, a great bail supervision pilot, although more likely if you're a woman than, a, than a, if you're a man. And so it's, um, it is a mixed picture. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's no surprise that a remand has continued unabated. In which case, are we, are we misdirecting by focusing on what perhaps social work um, departments could be doing in order to provide the, the information and the confidence of prosecutors and, 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 and sheriffs to, 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 to take on um, alternatives to, to remand? I mean, I listened to Harry Burns giving evidence to the Health and Sport Committee. The majority of people that I saw in the custody court last week needed a care package. They were you know, people with alcohol problems, drug problems. And because there is a, you know, obviously we look for the propensity to reoffend for those who are drug abusing, then it is more likely that they will reoffend. If you look at places like the Netherlands and Germany, they will provide immediate access to immediate detox. Mm. That would be much more effective than remand. Mm. People would achieve much more, achieve better outcomes. So in terms of the postcode, um, that you were referring to earlier, are, are those options being woven in, in uh, amongst others in relation to housing uh, allocations and the rest of it? In some places, I mean, not too far from here, LEAP, which is mm. um, the abstinence programme, is absolutely outstanding. I absolutely, you know, I, I couldn't tell you how good it is. Mm -hmm. You know, and I asked them, could they take more people? Yes, they probably could. Would it be, and I know of defence agents who say they've been desperate to get people in. Mm -hmm. So. We need to look at this as a public health issue for a great majority of the people who are cycling in and out of our prisons. If we look at this just as a justice issue, then we won't achieve the paradigm shift that we require to start to put in other things to keep people um, mm -hmm. from offending and reduce victimisation. Mm -hmm. There's um, Catherine, you wanted to come in and then Tom. Yes, thank you. Um, just picking up really on, um, on Karen's point there, that um, our observation, um, working with some of the most vulnerable um, across society, whether or not they're, they're in remand, would be the, the issues about stickability of often universally available services. Um, so what we tend to find is our more chaotic um, individuals struggle to engage um, continually with services. So whether it's because um, changes of address mean that correspondence about appointments is missed, um, whether it's just the, the level of chaos and individual's life means that often trying to hold on to them and, and actually support them um, to get to a point where they can affect change is really challenging and often that's when we see people yo-yo in and out um, of a, a custodial or a remand situation and actually here um, rather than focusing specifically on the criminal justice social work element of the response and, and, and bail advice um, and provision of services to courts there is really a partnership um, element to this that's much broader um, than a justice response um, across um, health across third sector um, and across local authority um, provision. If I draw on the local example um, in, in Orkney where you're, you're seeing more of an integration between social work and, 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 and healthcare provision and, and whatnot, you've got housing um, colleagues uh, presumably sitting co-located um, with you. I mean, are, are local authorities and health boards 
now grasping um, the fact that a, a kind of a, a multi-pronged approach to, to some of these more complex uh, cases is the only way of getting the stickability that, that, that you referred to? I think it's about the, the multi-agency approach, absolutely, and looking at people's circumstances in the round. Um, so individuals exist in families and communities, and they have a range of issues um, that lots of different services can help to, to resolve. The, the challenge, I, I think, um, uh, and from a Social Work Scotland perspective, we would observe is that often our um, systems around appointing, um, for example, um, substance misuse support is, is not as flexible um, as perhaps it needs to be um, to uh, encourage um, the, the continued engagement of some of the most vulnerable and chaotic individuals. So, for example, um, if, if I um, have a GP's appointment on Friday, I'll, I'll know that I need to keep that. Um, and I will remember and I will have lots of different things that help me to get there. Um, but actually, for, for a lot of the people that we work with, um, they might not even know when Friday comes. Um, and so their ability to keep that appointment on Friday um, with a GP or with a, another service um, is, is limited. Um, and so actually, well, even if we can tap them into services, it's often the follow through um, and the actual real engagement um, on an ongoing basis, which is what people need to help them to, to make changes in their lives. And Tom? I'll, I'll keep it brief because it really follows on from that. I'll just be really clear, though there's a traditional view uh, of bail supervision, which is about compelling compliance and curfew and, and, and those rigid things. What we're talking about here is something much more holistic and, and, and the, the, the social work uh, part of that is absolutely crucial. The, the, the pilot or the project I talked about, which uh, it was undoubtedly successful, was really successful because the court social work and the third sector were really the one team and they were working together. And, and, and the reality is that, I mean, just one very quick anecdote, a woman who has breached her DTTO, she's breached everything, that everybody's added off and there's only one place this woman's going to and we asked for adjournment. Now, the first conversation between the court social worker and the third sector was, but we need to see, put a package around her, put a plan around her, and, and tomorrow uh, we, we will start. Uh, but today, uh, getting the, the, the court to accept that this is a credible solution. Now, the first response uh, really was, she can't comply. She's not complying. Why would you? The very point's been made. And the third sector response was, she's got to comply. This is last chance saloon. And the really honest conversation. That woman kept 11 of her 12 appointments, mm -hmm. and the one she didn't, she had a reason for, and she went back onto DTTO. So I think it's very, very crucial that we don't write people off here because the system is not flexible enough and not holistic enough. Mm -hmm. It is those other wider supports. And the final bit is, we talk about is housing at the table, is health at the table, and the rest of it. Very often they are at the table and the conversation are right, but from a third sector perspective, the referrals between each other is pretty rigid and s systemic. And that's where it falls between. You need someone who can go between the spaces, etc., that, that doesn't have one alignment, that can make those appointments and make sure someone's there a, on Friday, that sort of thing. That's the, that's the holistic bit, which is maybe not just about the process diagram. Right. OK. And supplementary, Fulton? Thank you. It's actually a, <clears throat> a point later on in the bail supervision, but I think this is probably a good time to bring it in. As, as a supplementary, I should also uh, declare an interest as a registered social worker in the uh, uh, Scottish Social Services Council. Um, obviously, the, the community payback order, one of the purposes of that was to try and bring in a more holistic approach. So when somebody's actually convicted and given, a, given an order, uh, there are sometimes conditions for health services and, and such like to be involved. But in relation to remand, we're in a to totally different position. So just picking up, Tom, what you had said there and, and for the rest of the panel, is there is something that you would see that, that could work as a, a universally across Scotland to give somebody that... Uh, Bit more teeth, if you like, to be able to do the work to get the different agencies involved. Perhaps, like a uh, bail supervision officer, I should say that in the area where I worked, bail supervision was was very effective. I think that it was um, it was regarded uh, as as particularly successful in that area. I know that it isn't it's it's patchy across the country, but would you have any suggestions on that? Yeah. Uh, there are a number of examples where. Um, people who have successfully moved through bail supervision move on to, because of the disposal of the court, to community payback. And then the, the real uh, crux, when you, you're in that position, that that's not simply about supervision of unpaid work. It is the wider 
and there's great examples across all authorities of where that's happening. So the point you're making is right, but it, it must be an end-to-end -end pathway that everybody understands what we're trying to achieve. Thank you. It probably speaks to both, the first point and the second point, in terms of um, that response to people um, who are uh, subject to bail. We. The, 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 the committee will know that the, the new model of community justice across Scotland is now rolled out across the 32 areas, the local authority areas in Scotland. And each of the areas are required to produce and have produced a community justice outcome improvement plan. Um, and many of those speak to the issues of remand and bail. The concept behind that is to develop comprehensive, cohesive local services that are a response to um, individuals who are within the justice system. I think that sometimes that the, the justice element of it obfuscates us to the fact that these are individuals who don't come on a level playing field. There are people, people who, by and large, have numerous complex difficulties arising from a whole range of previous trauma. Um, and there are people who, as, as Tom referred to, there are people who don't comply, who find difficult in compliance, um, where the system uh, generally demands 100% compliance 100% of the time. The idea behind the community justice outcome improvement plans is specifically that for all local partners to have a common vision of what community justice means in that area. A part of that will be about when people are bailed to the community. What is our response? What is our collective response to issues of Let's help people not lose their accommodation. Let's people help people not lose their employment. Let's help people stay connected to their family. These are issues that we know impact and actually help improve people's lives. So it is as much about, whilst we, we, we do need to think about the structures that we have around about it, it is much, much more about the people-centred uh, approach in terms of that whole issue of it being a, 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 a public health issue um, and that if we don't address those issues with people, if we keep seeking to punish, 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 then we will further marginalise people. Notwithstanding the issue that, yes, absolutely, there are d a, a dangerous uh, and harmful individuals out there in the community, the vast majority of people who we deal with through, uh, for example, community justice, uh, criminal justice, social work and associated services are people who are in need of care, are in need of help, are in need of assistance and present as much a risk to themselves as they do to other people. OK, thank you for that. Um, Maurice Corrie, something. Thank you, Kavina. Yeah, um, I'm absolutely... It, what I'm hearing is complete music to my ears because I visited um, the Majesty's Prison Barlini on Friday and this exactly is what came out from the, the, the lead on the support um, for outcomes, etc., and the Deputy Governor of the Jail um, because it's quite clearly an issue there. 40% of the people were just a revolving door situation and one of the things they said was this coordination by social services and local authorities coming together uh, with the police. Now, there's an example. I was lucky last year to visit North Devon Council um, partly because on holiday, but I was interested in what they were doing. And they have a multi-agency team in their, in, in their um, headquarters, and it has reduced their problems by 50%, because the police are next door to social services, next door to other people. Can I ask Thomas Jackson, what are you doing about it at COSLA uh, in relation to encouraging county, um, local authorities to do exactly that? I mean, I should reflect that any answer I can give, I have a better knowledge of Glasgow than I do of every right. local authority, and, and it is a, a varied picture. I mean, I think picking up on a couple of points from today's discussion, first of all, I think we need to make sure that alongside discussion around bail supervision, we talk about voluntary opportunities. Mm -hmm. In Glasgow, and it's not unique to Glasgow, we have a third sector partnership between three third sector organizations who sit in a social work office and provide an option for women. It's a women's based service mm -hmm. for, for bail support entirely voluntary, there's no conditions within that, and we're having very positive outcomes from that. So first of all, we have to make sure that we're, we're broadening our, our, our opportunities for people. We also have to look at the, the overall impact. So um, you mentioned at Barlini that constant churn, and that is a unique situation for Barlini, but in terms of remand, I know this, this committee's already received evidence that about 20% of the daily population 
are individuals in custody and they're there on remand. Actually, the daily reception is closer to 60%. For women, it's well over 60%. So we're actually talking about a huge volume of individuals. You've heard today that when we're talking about these individuals, we're talking about individuals with very complex needs. And that raises the issue about where the resources are going to come from. We're talking about complex needs. We know what works. We know the evidence of that. Yet Audit Scotland's own study in 2012, where they identified that there's a three billion pound spend on reoffending in Scotland, said only 16% of that is spent in terms of rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. So our shift in justice spend needs to focus on what we can do in the community. There's plenty of good examples out there across the third sector, across the public sector. And, and I think we could do a lot more of that if we could think about how to take some of our investment that's currently locked up in prisons and put it in the community. Yeah. Liam Kemp. <laughs> Thank you, convener. Yeah, during our previous evidence session, uh, we were told that there, there was a lack of robust data on why judges are still putting people on remand. Uh, do you have any view on why? Uh, th that I find very odd. So do you have a view on why that data is not being captured? Uh, but secondly, do any of you have any, data might be too strong a word, but any anecdotal evidence as to why judges are still putting people on remand. Um, Tom, then keep again. In terms of that, of what we have, just from the projects that we have done, and uh, we, we have figures around outcomes for the people, in, for instance, in, in, in one, uh, area, three local authority areas over a period, I can tell you, there was 250 cases, and I can give you the breakdown of what happened. So we can give you sufficient evidence to draw inference from, which I think would be helpful and, and, and that's available. But the, but the reality is in the experience that we had in the project I, I told you about with the, the 30 cases, the, there was great support from the court, from the sentencers, and they, they did a survey of the, their own uh, courts in that sheriff them uh, over a five week period, and there was 70 remands. Only two were women. So the, the, this folk, I mean, the, the, I'm making that point. Now, the, the two women are extremely important, but, the, but the, 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 if you talk about numbers, the, that project wasn't touching the large number of males that were going through remand. Um, but what was clear that came out of that was the sentences, as have been referred to, the court was very supportive, so long as the community alternative is credible and, and, and consistent and is there. And what they're faced with, if you've got someone who's breaching all the time, who's, who's reappearing and you've got, you don't have an alternative, then it forces you down a route. So this is about making sure that what we provide in community to support that actually supports the aims of the court, which is not to put someone in prison at that stage. Can I ask, just on that, just to clarify, I, I, I'm going to reflect back what I heard, and it might sound quite pejorative. I don't mean it okay. that way. Um, do I take it from that that the judges or, or the, the, the people saying we are going to hold people on remand are concluding that the community alternatives are not credible, to use the word? Is, is that why judges are deciding to use remand? What, in that particular case, where if you have someone who's presenting at you for not the first time, not the second time, and, it's, and are not complying. Mm -hmm. And there is no wraparound service, there's no holistic service, there's no report in front of you, there's no resource in front of you that's going to actually see that through. And, and you know that if you just actually release as you did the last time, we're going to be back here next week, if that's my uh, phrase, um, then that's not a credible position. Whereas, as we had, we had an adjournment, we had a court social worker, we had the third sector partner, there was a, a, there was a, a needs assessment done, there was a, a care plan put in place, and we come back and say, this is what's going to happen. And if there's no compliance with that, then it's a different discussion. So anecdotally, effectively, the judge is saying, what else am I supposed to do? Is that... Well, that, that, that was the impression I certainly had in that case. Thank you. Keith, and then Karen. I think that the... the, the absolutely, I have no dis disagree with any of that. And... What I'm going to say here, um, please, I preface it by saying this is no meant as a criticism of anybody, any, any, any sentencer or procurator or fiscal. But when you look at the legislation, the legislation is difficult in and of itself because the driving legislation behind it, the Criminal Procedure 1995 Act, Section 27C for the bed and me, um, it talks about taking consideration of factors that say substantial risk of uh, failure to appear, substantial risk of reoffending. 
These are unquantifiable statements and it is left within court in a very complex um, and very speedy process to make decisions. It's further complicated by uh, additional factors in the legislation that asks, um, has this person previously, have the previous convictions, have they previously failed in order without any recognition of how previous is that? I suppose the overall picture is that if you're going to make a, an assessment of the risk that individual presents in court at that time, um, I suppose there is an, there's a question in the examination of how are those processes uh, driven, what are the outcomes of those processes, what is the evidence that drives th that decision making um, within court at that time. There's another part of the legislation that requires um, that where bail is granted or refused that there should be a, a record kept of this. Now, I'm, I'm aware that in some cases there are, some cases there aren't, but you asked about the lack of data. Um, you're, uh, you're right in that, that aspect because we don't actually know um, if remand has been applied when individuals, is it the same individuals were remanding time on time? Uh, is there a difference between remand uh, being used in solemn or so many cases? There's a a dearth of data within that. So I think the, the two elements are, 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 are compounded. Okay. So I would just say I absolutely agree with you. I mean, it is an area that is ripe for problem solving. When I was at the court um, on Monday, I actually picked up a form, which is a Procurator's Fiscal form. And it actually is a report by Sheriff, whoever it is, in a bail application. And it goes through criteria, yes or no, about why they are you know, giving bail or refusing bail. I don't know where that's kept. I don't know if it is filled in. But it would absolutely be useful if we were starting to look at it going forward. I think there's another point that I would just highlight is our tolerance for risk. We are so used to applying risk models for some of our most dangerous people in our society, and that is absolutely right, that we also tend to use that tolerance of risk for some of our more chaotic and I think that that is impacting on remand. When I sat in the court, and, and I've sat in numerous custody courts now, I do see a lack of knowledge about some of the things that are out there. Um, we're obviously looking forward to electronic monitoring, and you know, I'm heavily involved in that, and particularly around bail and the use of GPS, which I think will make a big difference in, you know, as opposed to the radio frequency that is now used. But there is a lack of knowledge about what's around in the courts just now. You know, the people who were really good were the defence agents. I have to say, I was just so impressed by the quality of the defence agents that I, that I saw in the court. They knew their clients. They understood their journey. They had, had you know, some knew their clients very well. And they represented them very well in the court. And they also highlighted opportunities of third sector services and other services that were out there. And, and I have to say, I came away thinking I need to contact more of the defence agents to tell them what's available. Uh, defence agent, you mean the solicitor? Sorry, defence solicitor, yeah, sorry. I'll bring in John Finney and then Kat. Thank you. It, it is related to that point, and indeed an example Mr Halpin gave um, earlier. And we had previously commended to us um, stand-down reports and, and previous evidence. And it would seem that there's a pivotal role following on, again, from what Ms McCluskey said there, uh, for the criminal justice social worker in the court connected with the sentencer. Is it the case that sentences are being um, meted out in the absence of a criminal justice social worker being present in the court? And if so, is that possible that could be addressed? Yes, uh, I mean, clearly there'll be a broader uh, perspective on uh, criminal justice uh, social workers in courts. In, in, in our experience, it, that that can be um, very much uh, subject to demands that are on the local department, whether they're available that day, etc. Um, the, the the thing there about the, uh, the 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 reform of the system, we've got to be careful with not shifting the deck chairs around the deck. You know, when we talk about reform, it's about we'll do it in that team and then we'll outsource it. We'll do this, and actually we're still doing the same thing. You know, it, the, a lot of these, the, the, the point that uh, Karen made around the risk is very relevant. A lot of the, 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 the risk assessments that we brought in, we brought in at a time before austerity. You know, so the resourcing around that was at that time. So is it time to go back and look at what do we mean by risk assessment? Are these still relevant in the context of the resource that we have today? Because all that, all that resource is tied into that. You know, and is, is that actually the resource that's changing lives? 
or is it, is it giving information to is it administration of justice? So I think there is something about really going back and looking at what is it that we're doing here, and, and, and broader than is there someone that can get you to a housing appointment? You know, that, that's really, really important, but it's, a, it's the whole system in, when you talk about reform. Catherine, then Thomas. Thank you. Um, just to pick up on the uh, original question around um, decision making in courts, um, there has been some research done in a number of different jurisdictions around um, sentencing decision making. Um, and I have had the opportunity to talk to a number of sentencers um, in my career about that issue. Um, and I, I guess what I would share um, around that is that every individual case is an individual case, is the response that you would get. And actually, um, I, I think the courts are often weighing in the balance um, risk seriousness of the alleged incident and also um, a perception around uh, a history of compliance or non-compliance with court or other orders um, that, that uh, are around, but also the nature of how someone presents on a given day, um, I think, would also um, feature. There's no doubt that the availability of information um, to courts to help them contextualise that individual um, would be of greater assistance. And I think um, there is some variability around how court criminal justice social work is delivered in practice. Now, not every court is created equal um, and not every um, criminal justice social work service has the same level of funding available. So the reality then of delivering court-based social work services um, is that you might be one single um, social worker who um, is covering a, a day on duty in a court, um, possibly covering more than one sitting court at a time and possibly running from one court to another to try and capture um, the people that you want to engage with. Um, and in our written response, I think we've given a flavour of some of the tasks that a criminal justice social worker in, in the court would undertake. Um, and they may be the only person doing that across several courts in one building at any given point in time. They're also in demand from uh, various solicitors representing clients looking for updates, any information, so that solicitors can also try and inform the court around um, their individual client's circumstances. Um, so it's a really complex situation, um, I think one um, that involves quite a lot of juggling um, and making decisions um, real time about where best to give their time of the court. And of course, if your time is taken away um, individually interviewing someone um, who has perhaps just received a custodial sentence or has been remanded in custody, someone whose family is very distressed um, as a result of that decision, you're not then in court available to provide information about someone else. And so there's a, a kind of real world um, issue here about how we would provide sufficient cover in those settings to mean that in every instance um, there was real in-depth meaningful information at the court's disposal to help decision making. Okay, okay Thomas, and then I'll bring in Liam Kerr again. I, I think Catherine picked up on some of the key issues around stand-down reports or same-day reports, but there are 3,700 were, were issued in the last day of full, last year full records, and more than half of those are oral reports. And Catherine also picked up there's a whole range of informal information that gets to the court's ears through solicitors, through other means via social work. So social work do provide that resource. It does vary. I think that's a fair point across Scotland. The issue is, though, about a judge's decision. They're trying to make a rational decision in a complex setting, as, as Keith highlighted, with a very complex set of individuals. And how do we shift that confidence? More information is one of those ways. I think it's also about more options. What are our community options that we have available? Um, in our evidence that we submitted, we presented some information. We've had investment in women's services. So in terms of a woman going to court, we know now that we can put up a greater support for women who might be facing a decision between remand and bail. We don't have that same resource investment in terms of, of men. And so I guess, again, the question comes back to, we have invested well in aspects of the justice service. So a, a judge will have every confidence that if they send somebody to custody, that they'll reappear in court. We haven't necessarily made the same sort of investment in our community services, and that's got to be a crux of today's discussion. Uh, thought and supplementary? Just, just following on from the, the discussion that we're having just now, how important do you think that the local courts are in that then? And I know there's obviously been changes uh, uh, to the, the local court system uh, recently. And, and just to, to do the whole question, and I wonder if you like, how, how can that situation be resolved? Because I do think that having local knowledge at local courts, in my own experience, was very, very effective because it didn't always rely on the court social worker 
to provide the information, the local office could also provide that. How can that um, problem be resolved going forward? The, um, sorry. Yes. Sorry. I, I mean, I think that the evidence from places like Red Hook, the community courts, that having a stable sheriff who sees lots and you know who sees the same people can have a real positive outcome on some of the you know the most difficult people that we're that we're seeing day in day out. It is a challenge when there are numerous courts sitting, and you know I mean you've got big places like Glasgow and Edinburgh when they might see different people each site each time. So. It is, I mean, the evidence base tells us that some of the community court models definitely work. They are incredibly expensive. People tend to focus on the building and not the process. But I definitely think when we see things like the drug court and, you know, and there's about to be a new alcohol court in Glasgow and some of the alcohol court in Edinburgh, it's shown real success because the people who are sitting on the bench are absolutely invested in it. And, and so are the people who are coming in front of them. I don't think there's anyone else was there. No. no. Liam Kerr, your, your other question. Yes, thank you. Uh, Karen McCluskey, I'd like to come back to you. You mentioned electronic monitoring. Uh, now, we heard in a previous session uh, that the Chief Inspector of Prisons is saying that electronic monitoring isn't available currently as a condition of bail, uh, but might be in the future. Uh, are you able to help me understand, first of all, why is it not available now? Um, how likely is might be available in the future? Uh, and uh, any of the panel, uh, what difference would that make to remand numbers if, ele ele if electronic monitoring was available? So my understanding is it used to be a provision that you could use EM for bail. Of course, it was radio frequency, so you had to have a box in your house, and it's, it's quite cumbersome. So we are, I was just come off the expert group in electronic monitoring, so we have recommended that both GPS and alcohol monitoring be recommended. And they are now drafting the legislation at the moment and that will have to go through a process. And we have used it, we have proposed that it should be used for a range of things from bail, from you know, people coming out of prison. It's an extra tool. However, it's not just technology. It's a bit like wearing a Fitbit and then expecting that you're going to lose weight or become fitter. You need to be supported, you know, with electronic monitoring on. I mean, if I'm putting an alcohol bracelet on someone, I need to help them avoid alcohol, you know, so that's about finding their sober friends and sober places. It can't just be about the technology, but I have great hopes. Um, the evidence base from Germany and from America is actually very, is very positive. And I hope that we should be able to use it for bail, but we should we'll have to also support people. So if you were doing a thing like a house and first model or you were doing, you know, some of the bail supervision, you know, it could be an extra tool in the sheriff's toolbox. Okay, Catherine. Hi there. Um, I just want to add to, to that that um, I think electronic monitoring from a Social Work Scotland perspective, any other tool um, that can help us to reduce um, the unnecessary use of remand um, would be very welcome. Um, I would only caution against um, the potential risk of up-tariffing um, existing bail supervision cases. So, um, what I mean by that is that um, we've, we've seen bail supervision now um, for oh, a, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of years um, from its original pilots, and it has grown. Um, but actually, the use of remand has grown exponentially alongside it. So, our concern would be that we add um, more punitive measures um, and more restrictive measures to bail supervision, but it doesn't at the same time correspond with a reduction in the use of remand. So whilst we would support um, the use of, of other and more restrictive measures, we would welcome that being tallied to um, a use um, of remand that, that reflects that population has shifted as opposed to we bring people who are on ordinary bail at the moment or bail supervision up to bail supervision plus. And that would be a risk, I think, that we would need to, to be mindful of. Okay. So Liam MacArthur, supplement. Uh, just trying to get my head around the, the statistics and the trajectory we've seen in, in, in remand. I mean, we're constantly told um, that uh, crime figures across a, a, a range of measures uh, are down. We've got a presumption against shorter sentences soon to be uh, extended further. We've got the, um, the, the various supportive measures we're talking about, and we're talking about electronic monitoring as well. Um, it just seems counterintuitive that at the same time we're seeing this increase in, 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 in remand. And I, I, I think we've explored quite well the, the, the complex issues um, that each of those individuals have that, that explain some of those cases. But it, but it, it does seem to be a picture where 
um, trends don't necessarily appear to be following the, the way you would expect looking at some of the other figures in relation to crime figures in terms of, of, of presumptions against shorter sentences. So I'm, I'm sure I won't give you the answer in, in the sense of exactly why, but to, to, re, to, to confirm what your, your, your concern is, you know, the, the, the Shine Women's Mentoring Service, which uh, across Scotland uh, works with a, a, a 800 women a, a year. Um, now, that's for women serving short sentences or on remand, so that's less than four years. It's a big bit mm. of the population. And... Um, we know that 76% of the women who would be eligible for SHINE do engage with it. So mm -hmm. it's not as though we're not getting a fair representation. But half the women in SHINE are on remand. And, and, and that, that seems awful disproportionate in terms of if you're working in the prison. And, and it's about pe people starting through care, people coming back in reintegration. And the reality is, if you look at those figures, it tells you there's a disproportionate use of remand. And then you look at that, that group, and 70% of them are not getting a custodial sentence. You know, that, so you then go into the issues that you were talking about that we, we, we're all very aware of. So the, the, it, 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 it brings you back to the answer to your question is, it's our inability to, to deal with the chaos. And that, that's a fundamental thing. It's not about the seriousness of offending. It's not, it's not about a uh, legal process. It's not about that. It's, it's just the inability to deal with that. And, uh, uh, to, to, to comply and we don't know how, how, to, how to tackle it. Karen, then Thomas. So, I'll just say, you're absolutely right. We're at a 42 year low for crime. You know, our, you know the, the movements that have been made on youth offending are pretty spectacular. And I think that we shouldn't in Scotland forget how far we've come from, you know, from the place we were. But 80% of the police calls at the moment are about vulnerability. It's no crime, it's vulnerability. That's exactly what we're seeing in the courts. And I think, you know, the problem is we're seeing this through a lens of justice and not looking at it through the lens of vulnerability. And Police Scotland are having to look at, at, at this completely differently as well. Upskilling people in mental health, um, training and a whole range of other things. But we are, we are dealing with a different, you know, a different thing now. You know, and, and many of our services just aren't fit for purpose. You know, we don't have the level of services. We have defunded services, you know, because we have austerity and that's understandable but I think that community justice and returning people to communities and improving their health outcomes has to be a priority and it has to be a priority when our budgets are set. Thomas? Yeah, I think Tom said it very well when he said we're dealing with, with chaos and that's got to be a feature in any interpretation of this. I think we also have to look at the whole of the justice trail because in this same period we've also seen a reduction in police undertakings and we've seen reductions in police disposals and procurative fiscal disposals. So earlier in the system we're also not taking people out, we're not providing the right supports to make those viable options. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to Rona. Thank you, uh, convener. Um, yeah, just following on really from what we've been talking about, I'm very interested in women in the justice system and women in remand. And as you said, the, we heard the figure of 70% of women not going on to be sentenced and also things like women pretending not to have children in case they were subsequently removed, etc., which is shocking. Um, the 2012 report of the Commission on Women Offenders included recommendations such as bail supervision, electronic monitoring, etc. Um, you know, my question was to what extent have the recommendations been implemented? You've, you've kind of answered that, I suppose, in a way. But I'm interested in, Thomas, if you could maybe expand on the Glasgow monitored bail system, which seems to be successful. And is that similar to the Shine product that Tom was talking about? I, I think... Following um, the, the report in 2012 and the government's response, we saw quite a hive of activity across Scotland in terms of supporting women. So in Glasgow, we've been very fortunate. We've been able to establish, as defined in the Angelini report, a women's justice centre. We have Tomorrow's Women in Glasgow that's been operating now for, for three and a half years, has, has really proven itself in terms of being able to work with a range of vulnerable individuals, individuals who haven't previously engaged with the service. We also established a new um, supported bail project that's delivered by three third sector organizations, each providing a slightly different area of expertise. So Turning Point Scotland, Aberlour Childcare Trust, and Why People, who are an accommodation specialist, again, targeting women. It came out of a justice reinvestment from the government. They, they identified 1.5 million pounds that they top sliced from the SBS budget and distributed across Scotland. And that allowed us to establish new services such as that. So we do have quite a, 
a rich response to women, and we're starting to see the, the, the fruits of that in terms of you know, what the outcomes are for that. We don't have nearly the same in terms of men. Um, have we achieved everything that was set out in the Angelini Commission? No, I don't, I don't think we have. I think we still have to watch that. And so now, even now, nearly six years on, it's, it's worthy of keeping an eye on it. Is that project specific to Glasgow, or is it, is it anywhere else in Scotland? There are other projects. I, I, I know SACRA lead on some and have led on some that have, have now not been able to, to funding has ceased. But um, um, the, the project that I'm talking about is unique to Glasgow. Yeah, Karen. So I would say there are projects everywhere. There's a, a great service in North Lanarkshire. There are services in Ayrshire. Um, and they are, they, are, they are springing up all over the place. You know, obviously, we've got the, the Inverness Justice Centre, which will be opening soon. So I see some really good work but it's still patchy. Mm. And for women who are in rural areas, I do worry. You know, it's, it's great if you live in a town centre, you know, where there's probably enough people to justify a service. But if you're in a very urban area, that's, you know, that's lacking. I have to say that I was very impressed when I went to Orkney. Orkney are very thoughtful around how they support um, the women in, in an area probably where they don't have a great deal of people mm -hmm. um, coming through their services. But I do slightly worry about that. Can I, can I just ask if there's a recognition amongst professionals that, that, that work in the system like, like yourselves, if there is a, a recognition of, of the fact that, that women present a, a fairly unique case in the sense of their needs and, and families and, um, you know, not to lessen the, the, the service that men get, but, you know, just, I think, is it recognised that there is a problem with women in remand, basically? Well, I think so. I mean, I, I don't think I have met anybody who has underestimated the damage and the trauma that are experienced by lots of the women. And my previous experience in, in working with you know, lots of women who've been involved in violence and domestic abuse and, and a whole range of things, they take much longer to get to a good outcome. It, you know, it takes years and years of work. And, and sometimes that we, we think that this happens over a short period of time. You know, people think, oh, well, you, can get, you can get an outcome in six months. So some of our colleagues in third sector, are, you know, they're funded for a very short period of time. These women will take a long time to get to a place where they are, you know, they have got a life that's predictable and understandable and manageable and have a sense of hope. Mm -hmm. and, and we also recognise that, you know, I think we are, you know, very understanding now about adverse childhood events mm -hmm. and the impact of trauma mm -hmm. and the fact that parental imprisonment is again an adverse childhood experience. Mm -hmm. So we're passing it on to people's kids. And if there's no greater reason to try and change the outcome for women is to make it better for their kids. Because we cannot pass that back on to the next generation. A number of the panel want to come in. So it's Tom, it's Catherine, Keith, and then Thomas. Thank you. Um, we, we, we know from the experience of Shine and uh, the, the, the work that came after the Angelini uh, Commission, it's evidence now that the, there's gender difference and it's absolutely so that, that, that's going beyond anecdotal and there's Ipsos more evaluations of it we can give you that so just just accept that that's that's now established but the point that I would make and you know it's go around the country you'll see great examples you'll see initiatives and all the different things but there still exists gender inequality in Scotland because it's not universal and that's the fundamental point that I would come from. Thank you. I, I can just tell you um, from my own experience around um, some of the, the services that are delivered in, in Tayside, which is the area that I'm from, specifically Angus Council, um, in my day job. Um, and, and we have a, a really good success rate, particularly with the Glen Isla project in, in Angus, which is a very rural area. Um, and, and there are really challenges around how to deliver um, a, a service um, specific for women, which are small in number in terms of Angus uh, criminal justice services. But what we found is um, that actually Actually, it's not the criminal justice social work part of the intervention that's important. Um, so, so we outreach into the Glen Isla service. We, 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 we do the compulsory parts um, that are needed by, by the court. But actually, it's, it's the kind of more community-based um, support of elements, um, some of the wraparound health um, care and support, and um, really the, the packaging of support around helping women to access uh, services that you or I would take for granted. Um, and it's, it's the longevity of that that's really important. So actually, we 
find women um, don't leave us, um, which is a real challenge then in terms of sustainability of that as an approach. So it grew from a justice perspective, but actually there's a recognition that there are a cohort of women in our area, um, and I've no doubt across other areas in Scotland, um, who need extra support um, in order to make and sustain changes in their lives, both for their own benefit, for the community's benefit, and for the benefit of their children and their families. Keith and then Thomas. Just in, in, in answer to your question, about the, is there the recognition? Uh, uh, absolutely. When you look at the community justice outcome improvement plans and having uh, had connection with the 32 areas across Scotland and uh, in, in the creation of the plans, absolutely recognised. Uh, it's an area that um, many many local areas toil with, um, and I think that we. There are other other factors. For example, the, the smaller local authorities haven't haven't been the justice manager and the elsewhere chief social work officer in one. Um, small areas that had, don't have many women that come through their service, how they bespoke um, uh, individual plans for those people and their families. But there's also, um, whilst I recognise the, the sterling work that's been done, for example, in Glasgow and the women's services, I think what we need to do is share how, or how and why those services work, how, for example, to get the buy-in from other partners like health, um, and how we then translate that to other plans across, not necessarily taking the Glasgow model and transplanting it, but how, find, and that bit about learning for the research of how that actually works, why it works, why it's made an impact, and see how we can, we can, we can share that, and um, particularly the bit about collective buy-in. Um, and that is the issue of buy-in and, and leverage across the 32 areas in Scotland is, in a community justice sense, is something that they are just toiling just now. For example, the relationship between uh, community justice partnerships and integrated joint boards and the services they deliver through health and social partnerships, the relationship between the two of those entities and community planning partnerships. We're really at the start of a local journey round about that. But yes, women are recognised. The specific issues for women in the justice service is recognised. Thomas? Yeah. C coming in last, I think everybody just about said it, but I mean, I think it's a given across Scotland, there isn't a women's service that isn't trauma-informed, where training isn't part of that. I mean, in Glasgow, tomorrow's women in Glasgow, the psychologist is, is based within the trauma team. That's what we see, is it? And we are sharing that training out the way. For example, tomorrow's women in Glasgow has provided training to Victim Support Scotland in Glasgow, recognising that they have a unique expertise, and we've built that up. I wanted to pick up on one thing Karen said as well, because I think it's really important for the committee to hear, which is this, this issue about how long you have to work with people for the changes to happen. And we're seeing that with women in particular. Tomorrow's Women in Glasgow, when we first set it up, and after 12 months of monitoring it, we saw very little movement in the sort of things we thought would change, like offending levels, health issues, relationships. And it was, it was a period where it was quite challenging to keep the public sector partners on board, to keep their investment there, the social workers, the nurses, the psychologists, the prison service, the comment, all of that staff were, were there on the goodwill of the public sector saying this is the way to move forward. It took another year before we started to see those substantial shifts because we were targeting the most vulnerable individuals. And that's something as well we have to understand. If we are going to target a higher level of individuals who are facing remand where we want to shift the bail, we're going to have to invest appropriately and recognize that we're dealing with, with individuals who may have extremely chaotic situations that we have to unpick over a longer period of time. Thank you. Murray. I was just say I was glad to hear the Glen Isla project mentioned. Well, I represent Angus North and Mairns, so it falls within my colleague Graham Day, uh, Angus South constituency, and I know he's raised that a number of times in Parliament. Um, but really, it was just going back to, I suppose, um, what Karen, you raised earlier, and about the wider impact on families, and you talked about ACEs. Um, recently, we've had a debate in that that Gail Ross, MSP, had brought to the Chamber the other week, so it is very much high on the agenda just now. And it's really just to hear a bit more about the the impact that being on remand has not only on the um, the person themselves but also on their on their wider families and what what impacts you see and I suppose particularly on women uh, given that there are a higher number of a higher percentage of women on remand and the fact that you know then the vast majority of them go on not to receive uh, custodial sentences so it's just really to hear a bit more about that who'd like to lead 
Um, also, also I will actually her. just say that I mean, my colleague Nancy <coughs> Luke should be here from Families Outside because she does this incredibly eloquently and the ripple effects of women being taken in remand and their kids going into care and sometimes losing their accommodation and going into debt and exacerbating mental health. I mean, I don't know where it ends. I mean, it, it, it is just a spiral. And there are lack of services on remand for women because, of course, you don't need to, you know, you don't need to go to work. You know, you can be staying in your cell for, you know, pretty much all day. That will absolutely exacerbate your mental health problems. So it is, you know, it's, it's catastrophic. I mean, it is catastrophic. There are very few women, and we know that with the presumption against short-term sentences, 98% of women are getting a sentence of less than 12 months. We must be able to do something about that going forward. You know, and design services to make a difference because it would be great if Scotland could sort of lead the world in terms of trying to change the outcome for some of our most vulnerable women. Catherine? But okay. Um, thank you. So what we do know um, is that uh, a period of remand or, or a period in custody is devastating for the individual concerned, but also for their family. So the, the kind of impact that we can see um, for children um, is sometimes they don't know what's happened to a loved one in their lives, so they just disappear for a period of time and nobody actually tells them um, the truth about what's happened sometimes because they think that's the best thing. But actually children know that something's not quite right. So somebody who was there in caring for you and loving you and taking care of you. Yesterday is just not there today and there was no notice of that. Now, I have a small child and I dread to think um, what he would make of that if I just wasn't there tomorrow. So I think we, we, we kind of conceptualise these things as happening over there to other people and somehow that makes it better. But actually, um, you know, how to process that as a child, um, I, I think is the untold damage emotionally that that does in terms of how you understand the world around you is a certain place where you can rely on people. And a lot of the children and young people who um, are impacted by uh, custody and remand will be children who already have uh, suffered um, adverse childhood experiences. Um, they may be children, for example, who are already not in the direct care of their parents um, and or um, who might be in the process of being assessed for alternative um, care arrangements. One of the direct consequences of um, periods of, of remand or custody can be that there are then um, unnecessary delays to those assessments. Um, so actually children's planning doesn't happen because parents are not available to, for example, be tested around rehabilitation um, because it's right and appropriate um, that we don't remove children unless we're absolutely sure that home is not the right place for them. But to do that, we actually need parents to be able to be physically present and engage. We also know that parents um, who are in a custodial setting often struggle to meaningfully engage in things like child protection case conference discussions about their children um, and also children's hearing and other court arrangements um, are more difficult. Um, and of course, people are presented in handcuffs um, at these meetings, which obviously sets a particular tone um, around their involvement. And that's scary for children when their parents turn up with, you know, two, two officers um, who have been there transporting them and they're handcuffed um, in, in the presence of, of the group making decisions about their lives. So all of these things, you know, um, are, I think, very damaging for families. But it's the missed birthdays, um, it's the missed first day at school, um, it's the missed goodnight story. It's all of these things that I think make it a very difficult impact for families to rationalise. But I also think that we forget that every individual who's in custody is also somebody's child. And the impact on their parents and their wider social support network um, is also a, a, a real challenge. Um, and even the practicalities of visiting people <clears throat> excuse me, on remand um, are really difficult um, and often very costly and expensive um, and, and time consuming. Uh, all of that puts a lot of extra pressure on families um, and the, the lack of availability of the resource that that person might have been bringing in had they been employed before they were remanded, all of that stops. Um, in terms of access to any benefits, um, that might need to be reassessed in the light of somebody not being in the family home. Um, so th th the ramifications are, are huge. They affect every facet of an individual's life and therefore every facet of their family's life. Um, now, the average period in remand is what, something like 23 days. All of that disruption for 23 days. 
Thank you very much. That was well made. We are n getting nearer the, the close. We've only got about another five minutes, in which time could I have Daniel Morrison then very briefly, please? Um, so I just wanted to pick up on, on something that Karen McCluskey uh, mentioned in her previous response, which is that, that the reality for people on remand is that they're, they're spending kind of long periods of time in a cell with nothing to do because they don't have to uh, participate in work. And, and this is a, a picture that we've heard uh, from uh, from other sources. What what do you think we, 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 we should be doing? Obviously, we, we hear what you're saying about we should try and stop people going on remand, but when they do, what should they be doing? Because that doesn't sound like a terribly good uh, activity. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're untried, they're unconvicted, yeah. you know, I mean, they're innocent, technically, you know, because they've not been through the court system. I would like to see better health services, and of course I would, I'm an ex-nurse, you know, I would like to see better health services. I would like to see good um, mental health services, um, you know, more support for women to, to be involved in, and to look at them not just as a deficit, but as an asset. You know that? We never ask people what they're good at, we only tell them what they're bad at. Mm -hmm. You know, and everybody has an asset. And we need to build on that within, you know, any time that we have, you know, it's a teachable moment. Pashak and De Clemente would say the motivation to change model can start at any time. I think that the period on demand should also be looked at the mo as a motivation to change. So that we, you know, people might be pre-contemplating or contemplating a change in their behaviour. And we should be able to support them. It's the wrong place for it to happen. But if it has to happen, and you know, if they are a threat to themselves or other people, but we should be trying to capitalise on that. Uh, can I just briefly ask? I mean, are you aware of any good examples where that is happening at all? It's probably just not enough. Yeah. Do you know? I mean, there's. I mean, don't get me wrong. I um, I have lots of colleagues within the prison system. And they will do their absolute very best in a very difficult circumstance. Many of the people who are coming in, both men and women, will be detoxing from drugs. You know, might be going through, you know, I mean, it, it, it's incredibly chaotic. So trying to provide that level of support might be really difficult when, you're, when you've got a huge volume of people. But, um, I mean, there are, it, it's scattered. It's scattered. But the, the problem is, if you've got such a big volume of people coming in a remand, you can't provide that service. Yeah. If we reduced it, then the ones who are there might get that level of service. So there, there, there are examples of um, good practice here. And, and, and the Shine project, again, I would, I would use as an example, which, although it, it, the example we give is around women, it would cross gender. Um, we, we have prison-based champions, we call them. Now, if, you, if you're on remand or you're in, on the, on the, in the prison and your peers and all the rest are not coming out of their cells and you're, you're lying on top of that bed because that's the norm and if you go and do something else, you're out the norm. That's a very difficult place to be, you know, so it's, it's going to be hard to break it. But having the, the champion working in the prison, engaging with people, starting the interviews about what will happen, engaging beyond that, speaking to your defence agent about what, how you're engaging, starting to get group activities going. Now, the, why is the prison service? The prison service resources are fully utilised in that area, and I think it's this engagement and, and the third sector, whether Shine is a, is a collaboration of a number of third sector organisations. It's not an organisational thing. It's about the ethos I'm talking about here. So that, that work inside the prison, work with them, and there, there is something there that I do think can be amplified and would, would actually start to address that difficult uh, cultural and situational uh, scenario that you've, you've, you've described. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Morris. Sorry. Uh, yes. yes. I mean, this has blown me away. I'll be absolutely frank with you, convener. This is all coming back to me when my visit to Berlin. I'm sorry to go on about it, but all this is absolutely incredible. Uh, it's happening there. And that was a cry from the support officers, from the, the, the prison go uh, the deputy governor, is this question, Catherine, about your mental health support. And I'm currently looking at a project about that in my own area in Vale of Leven, because we've got real issues there. Uh, and I think that is something that needs to be done. But, uh, I mean, the champions, yup, the guy sitting on the top bed, you know, the fear to get out of their bed because uh, they seem to be different to the others. I saw people on remand in there, in their, in their blue togs. I saw the rows are obviously custodial in red. Those were in grey who were doing the, who had got jobs to, to do, do the catering, what have you, all trying to integrate. And, I mean, they worked at the support teams. And the other thing that blew me away was at five o'clock at the family reception centre when those 
when the prisoners, and I, I avoided using the word prisoner, but the staff did, so we, we had to, was stowed out with families in tears and, you know, leaning on them heavily. There was stand, no standing room only. Sorry, standing room only. And, and the, the three staff that were put on there to, to work with the families, and they were NGOs, they weren't within the staff, were, were incredible. And so I, I really would like to meet you all again, actually, because I have some issues on that. Yeah, before, before you answer that, could you address it from the other side of the coin? And, you know, if we're reducing remand and people are going when they may have been expected to be in custody, how are the families and the victims kept in the loop? But well, the, the, the support as the alternative to remand is based in mentoring. It's not just about supervision. And you can't mentor without the, the wider support of families, friends, and the, the social capital that's around an individual. So I, I do think that the fundamental answer around supervision is but what's that holistic mentoring that you're offering? Yeah. Okay, thank you. And the point about keeping the, um, the family the, and the victims involved if suddenly they're expecting someone to remind them that doesn't happen? I, uh, sorry, I've, I've not understood that part of the question. I, I suppose if we're looking at measures to reduce remand, but there's an expectation perhaps that that person would have been um, would have been put on remand. How are the interests? How do we show victims and families? Because there's two sides of, of the There point. absolutely is. And, and there will be people who that remand is absolutely appropriate and that will be tested by the court. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that's the clarity of it. You know, that, that, that it's, it's not that a third sector organisation comes along and champions mm -hmm. someone should be out there. Sure. It's, it's, this is a decision of the court. And Catherine? Um, I guess my view of what victims would like is, is less than... than 20 days respite um, and, and actually what we know is that the adversity caused by a period of, of remand contributes to almost all of the facets of risk that we would assess in terms of uh, the likelihood of further reoffending. So if our um, aim and objective is to reduce the likelihood of that individual uh, committing further harm um, or further annoyance uh, in their community um, in whichever way um, that, that transpires then actually what we need to do is take every opportunity to reduce reduce the risks that they present um, rather than increase them through our systematic approach. Okay. Can I bring in Ben and then Thomas? Thank you, convener. I just, uh, Karen, a number of months ago, I hosted an event in here with Circle Scotland and uh, ASC uh, around their women's outreach teamwork. And that was quite a remarkable evening and quite a remarkable project. And I just wanted to give the opportunity, if you wanted, to say something about that project, because I think it was quite illustrative and demonstrative of how a different approach can, can be successful for all. I mean, they were incredibly supportive of the women. They saw them, I mean, just almost like I was saying before, they saw them as assets, but Shine and, and some other projects do similar things for, for women, but they supported them, you know, they looked at financial, they looked at everything that affected these women. And I think what was really important, I think, with with Circle was they allowed the women to think about what a different outcome might look like and where they wanted to be. And then they helped them along, along you know, supporting them along that way. And obviously we had a lady there who'd been supported and it was transformational. You know, I mean, she was able to look after her family. She could, you know, she could engage in work again. She was thinking about working. And, you know, the very fact that someone is able to again, to be part of the wealth creation of Scotland, to be able to support themselves, get square money, is, is quite a transformation. And I don't think anybody who was in that room could think, oh, that's not a good use of money, or that's soft justice, or that's you know, not the right thing to be doing. I, I, absolutely, and I, I'd be happy to provide the committee with more information on that if you want. Now, just, no, just very quickly, you also made a, a point earlier, which I thought was, was, was really important, about vulnerability combined so prevailing issues of vulnerability combined with a, a lack of knowledge in the court process. I wasn't sure if you were referring, because you said defence agents were, were very empathetic and, uh, and informed. I don't know if you were in, in saying that there was a lack of knowledge. Was that the judiciary had a lack of knowledge or the prosecutors had a lack of knowledge or the system didn't yeah. integrate yeah. enough? To be very Sorry, brief, because just, Thomas is still okay. to come in. So I'll just say that the PFs, the PFs and the sheriffs didn't always know everything that was available. The defence solicitors were very good. They had researched it, they knew exactly what was available and suggested it to the court. Thank you. And the last Thank word you. to Thomas. 
Um, just in terms of your question, first of all, convener, about that issue about how we communicate particularly to victims, I think the issue of consistency is really important. And as Catherine said, 21 days, 22 days out of, out of sync um, is, is maybe not that consistency. In terms of Cornerstone, I think that demonstrates just what we, I think a few of us have tried to say here today, that there's a real richness in the third sector in particular, mm -hmm. and we have some really leading examples that show we do know what works. And I guess the outstanding question is, are we going to shift our justice spend? Because again, if 60 percent of that three billion pounds spent on reoffending is, is focused on rehabilitation and the rest is much more reactive and punitive yeah. without the same sort of dividends then we're, we're getting that balance wrong and there is a, a long-term vision we need to be grasping and thinking about how we'll get there not not in one or two years but in five and ten years I think that's an excellent point to end on and a point that we are always looking at the spend and the, the amount you know not a one-year funding three-year funding give them the money to get on with doing the job that they do so well. Thank you so much. That's been such a worthwhile um, session today. We now move in to uh, move to our next um, our next agenda item, which is agenda item six. Are the members content to delegate responsibility to me to arrange for the Scottish Parliament corporate body to pay on request witness expenses for the remand evidence session? You yes. are agreed. Thank you very much. We now move into private session. That concludes the public part of today's meeting. Our next meeting will be on Tuesday 20th of February when we'll be holding a roundtable session on Brexit and policing and criminal justice. And we now move into private session.